You're watching a BBC News EU election special. With the Brexit party, a clear winner in the poll. The Liberal Democrats taking second place and a very tough night for the Conservatives and Labour. The Brexit party, formed only six weeks ago, are the big winners, gaining almost a third of the vote and 28 MEPs. We have got a mandate now and we want the government to include us in their negotiating team. We have got to get ready for leaving the European Union on October the 31st. There's an awful lot we can do. The Liberal Democrats, who campaigned to stop Brexit, come second with around 20% of the vote. And the Green Party makes significant gains, posting their best performance for 30 years. I'm Joanna Gosling at Westminster, where the two main parties have suffered heavy losses. Labour fall to third place overall, with less than 15% of the vote, prompting pressure on Jeremy Corbyn's approach to Brexit. We went into an election where the most important issue was what was our, what was our view on leaving the European Union. And we were not clear about it. We were not clear on the one single thing that people wanted to hear. The Conservatives are pushed into fifth place with an historic low of under 10% of the vote. The Home Secretary says the results are hugely disappointing and another minister says it's time to rethink their strategy. It's a wake-up call to my colleagues in Parliament that we have to deliver on the instruction the British people gave us in 2016 with the Brexit referendum. In Scotland, the SNP have dominated the poll, winning 38% of the vote. And in Wales, Labour are pushed into third place behind the Brexit party and Plaid Cymru. We'll bring you all the results and the picture across Europe, where turnout is up and the traditional parties have lost out to smaller ones, changing the balance of power in the European Parliament. Hello, good morning and welcome to this BBC News EU election special. In a major blow for the largest parties at Westminster, the Brexit party have emerged as the clear winner in the poll for a new European Parliament. Formed only six weeks ago, Nigel Farage's party have won 28 seats so far and received almost a third of the share of the vote. Both Labour and the Tories posted some of their worst results ever, while the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, who both oppose Brexit, have both increased their vote and seats. Well, the Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, said the results were hugely disappointing and a verdict on Brexit. With 10 out of 12 regions declared, let's take a look for you now at those results in detail. And it is the Brexit party that gained the largest share of the vote, with almost a third, with uh, 32%. Now, the Liberal Democrats took second place with 20%. 20 that's up 13 points compared to their result in the last EU elections of 2014. Labour, they came third with 14%. Uh, that's down 11 points on last time. The Greens, they increased their support, gaining 12% of the vote. The Conservatives fell to a historic low, fifth place in the poll and just 9% of the vote. Well, although we're still waiting for final results in Scotland, the SNP have polled strongly, while UKIP's vote fell heavily to just 3%. The new Change UK party also failed to make much impact. 73 seats in the European Parliament were up for grabs, with the Brexit party so far winning 28. Now, the Liberal Democrats have won 15. They gained just one in 2014. Labour have 10 MEPs, losing eight. The Greens have more than doubled their seats, with seven MEPs up four. And the impact on the Conservative Party is clear when it comes to seats. They've got just three MEPs, down 15. Ply Cymru have won one seat after beating Labour in Wales. The final results in Scotland will be declared later this morning. Counting in Northern Ireland starts today. Well, our first report today comes from our political correspondent Nick Eardley and a warning that uh, his report does contain some flash photography. 
a vote that wasn't supposed to take place to a parliament we're supposed to have left, a result that shows the country is still bitterly divided. The big winners, two parties with very different but very clear messages on Brexit. Brexit, Brexit now! Nigel Farage's Brexit party topped the poll with almost a third of the vote. The reason, of course, is very obvious. We voted to leave in a referendum. We were supposed to do so on March the 29th, and we haven't. The Liberal Democrats, with their anti-Brexit message, had a big night too, coming second across the UK. Every vote for the Liberal Democrats is a vote to stop Brexit. For the two parties that normally dominate British politics, it was a disaster. The Conservatives were thumped, finishing fifth with less than 10% of the vote. Three years ago, the country voted to leave. It's three years on and we haven't left. And inevitably, therefore, people were going to be drawn in a polarised way to the kind of single-issue pro- or anti-Brexit parties. Labour too were punished, finishing third with less than 15%. That'll spark a heated debate about whether it should now get fully behind another referendum. We're now going to find ourselves in a position where we will have a Tory leadership who will insist on either a bad deal or no deal at all. And I fear it will be no deal. And in those circumstances, we must be equally clear. And it will be a disaster for our country to have no deal. There should be a referendum and we should campaign to remain. <laughs> The Green vote was up too. They beat the Conservatives into fourth place. UKIP were wiped out and Change UK failed to make their mark. In Scotland, the SNP were miles ahead on almost 40%. The party will take three of the six seats there. In Wales, the Brexit party topped the poll. Plaid Cymru came second. Labour, a party who have dominated Welsh politics for a century, finished third. Northern Ireland counts today. It was a good night for parties who have taken a firm stand on Brexit, but voters are still split between parties who back leaving the EU as soon as possible and those who want another referendum and ultimately to stay. If you were hoping this would end the Brexit debate, you may well be disappointed. McKerry, BBC News. OK, let's take you straight to Westminster now, where the uh, two largest parties, as you've been hearing, have had a very difficult night. And Joanna Gosling is there for us right now. Morning, Joanna. Thank you, Ben. Yes, they'll be waking up and facing lots of soul-searching after that strategy for both Labour and the Tories to try to keep party supporters on both sides of the Brexit debate on side clearly failed in uh, what is increasingly looking like having been a pro uh, second referendum last night those results are really terrible for Labour and the Tories so the question for them both is which direction do they take now the Tory leadership race of course is already underway that was triggered last week and so last night is now likely to have a big impact on how Theresa May's prospective successor pitches their Brexit solution and all the suggestions and the pointers are in favour with it being a strongly pro-Brexit candidate. With Labour though also losing ground there are also questions as to what Labour's future policy will be and overnight Jeremy Corbyn indicating it may well be to push for a second referendum formally. They've uh, obviously been toying with that idea uh, but Jeremy Corbyn saying in the coming days that is a question that they are going to be strongly considering. So let's bring in our assistant political editor Norman Smith who is also here in Westminster. Um, Norman and in terms of providing any further clarification, uh, it's just really, as, uh, yet again, raised more questions. What's your analysis of, of where we are this morning? Well, I think the honest truth is we're not much further on than where we were from the original Brexit referendum. We remain a bitterly uh, divided country where the potential for compromise, for building some sort of consensus, just seems to be crumbling because if you look at the sort of two main victors, in this um, Euro election. Clearly, Nigel Farage's Brexit party with a very clear message to get out with no deal. And then if you look at the explicitly pro-referendum smaller parties, they too have done extremely well. The big losers are those who've muddled around in the centre ground, namely the two traditional uh, main parties, Labour and the Tories. And the implications for both are immense. And I suspect there will be a huge gravitational pull 
on both Mr Corbyn and whoever takes over the Tory party to move in the Tory sense towards no deal and for Mr Corbyn to move towards another referendum. And if you are a Tory MP, a Tory party member wondering who to choose in this leadership contest, you surely are going to think, well, look, we're going to need to have somebody who can see off Nigel Farage, which presumably is going to mean the most sort of uncompromising, no nonsense, no dealer in town, which, you know, could well be Boris Johnson. We don't know because the threat Mr Farage is now posing is not merely trouncing the parties in the Euro election, but he was pretty clear this morning that if the UK does not leave without a deal by October the 31st, then he will put up candidates in any forthcoming general election in all 650 seats. Have a listen to him. There is much more change needed in British politics. The two-party system isn't fit for purpose. There are institutions like the House of Lords uh, that frankly have become an absolute parody of themselves. There's a lot of work to do beyond Brexit to modernise and change the shape of British politics. But our primary goal is to get this country to be independent and self-governing. If that doesn't happen, and if we don't leave on the 31st of October, then what you will see is the Brexit party stunning everybody at the next general election. So huge impact on the Tory party, but also on the Labour side. I think we are beginning to see massive pressure now being heaped on Mr Corbyn to end this sort of ambiguous stance on Brexit and to explicitly embrace the idea of another referendum. We saw that last night with Emily Thornberry straight off saying the party needs to get off the fence and start talking about a referendum and campaigning for Remain. Interesting too in the statement put out overnight by Mr Corbyn, he talks about another public vote, meaning a general election or another referendum. But what is most interesting is there is no mention at all in Mr Corbyn's statement of campaigning to deliver on Brexit, to deliver a Labour Brexit. That now appears to be disappearing. A view echoed, it has to be said this morning, by John McDonnell in a tweet he put out. Also, no mention at all of delivering on Brexit, just saying Labour now needs to back a public vote. In the meantime, of course, it is the Lib Dems who are seen as the big Remain party. And that certainly was the message from their president, Sal Brinton. People had written us off and said we couldn't recover. And I am so proud of our members, 100,000 members across the country who have worked hard, built up, helped us with a strong message. Hundreds of thousands of people who joined our Stop Brexit campaign, which resulted on Thursday in millions of people voting for us as the strongest Remain party. We've got our best ever European election results and it's really, really encouraging for the future. You're left with a sense that both the main parties are now going to be pulled away from the centre ground with the Tories having to, in effect, embrace no deal and Labour having to embrace another referendum. And really, you kind of wonder where have we got to in the past three years? Because we seem almost to be getting back to square one where we started this whole process with you're either for leave or for remain. Norman, thank you. Well, we have, of course, had these national elections, but they're for seats in the European Parliament. So nothing changes here in Westminster in terms of the makeup of Parliament. And we've seen over the past few years how things have gone in terms of trying to get some form of consensus. So the days and weeks ahead are going to be absolutely vital to see which direction both of the main parties take and what that means for whether the country does have to go back to another vote here to try to get some clarity in terms of what happens happens in Westminster. For now, I'll hand you back to Ben. Uh, Joanna, thank you very much indeed. Well, uh, the picture in the rest of Europe is changing too, with shifts away from the main parties to gains from smaller ones. This means the blocs and alliances in the European Parliament will change significantly. Let's go to our Europe correspondent, Damien Grammaticus, who's in Brussels. What is the picture across Europe, do you think, after these election results? Ben, yeah, you talk about blocks and alliances. The voter results on the ground translate here into real power through those blocks and alliances, through how the sort of groupings come together from all the different countries. What has happened there? Well, the real momentum, I think, out of this is going to the Greens and the Liberals. They're the ones who've done surprisingly well. Parties that view themselves, as you say, smaller parties, but parties that view themselves uh, as... Uh, 
uh, climate policies, uh, open to migration, defending uh, democratic values in Europe. They have done well last night. Uh, and although the big sort of old groupings of the Christian Democrats around Chancellor Merkel on the centre right, the socialist social Democrats on the centre left have fallen, those other sort of pro-EU parties have risen. So that pro-EU group still holds a, a, the real sort of bulk of seats here. And that is a slightly surprising result because the nationalists, the far right, did well in Italy. Yes, they did well in France, not beyond expectations. Marine Le Pen topping the poll just, but not really any momentum for her there. Elsewhere, though, the, the far right stumbled. So in smaller countries, in Finland, in Denmark, in the Netherlands, not doing uh, as well as expected. So the far right wave hasn't really appeared and you get that central sort of EU grouping. But this time the Greens and the Liberals coming with a greater presence who are sort of holding on. That's the broad picture. And in terms of Brexit, how do you think uh, people there in Brussels will be viewing the success overnight of the Brexit party and Nigel Farage? Well, the first thing they're contemplating is the return of those British MEPs here with a big contingent led by Nigel Farage. Uh, I have to say, many in the European Parliament quite openly not relishing that prospect. Uh, but I think viewing the, the fact that they could only be here, those British MEPs, for a matter of weeks. If they come in July, leave by the end of October. Uh, so they won't shift the balance in the long term. What they do is sort of shift the balance immediately while the EU is debating and choosing the new top jobs for the running the EU's institutions. All those will be decided in the coming weeks. The head of the Commission, the president of the Council, Donald Tusk's replacement, John claude Juncker's replacement, the breakdown of parties here uh, will have an Im will it be reflected in those negotiations, and that's much more wide open question now, because those big central groupings have seen their vote share split and spread across the others. That is going to be quite a, a sort of battle going on now behind the scenes as they try to lay those out. But broadly on the Brexit question, what's interesting is that what we've seen. Uh, the other sceptical parties across the EU have actually softened their position in Italy, in France, uh, in the Netherlands, not calling for their own countries to follow the UK out. They've called for reforms within the EU, returns of powers to, na to nations rather than the, the centre, but not an exit of their own. And I think that's a, a trend that we will see followed into the Parliament. Brexit not really being translated into changes here. All right, Damien, thank you very much indeed. That's Damien Grammaticus reporting there. Let's get more political reaction here. Uh, and Joanna's got that at Westminster. Thank you very much, Ben. Well, with me now is the Conservative MP and Deputy Chairman of the European Research Group, Steve Baker. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Um, in your view, does the Tory party now need to out-Farage Farage? No, we don't want to be out-Faraging Nigel Farage. I mean, he, he is what he is and he's been tremendously successful. We need to be ourselves. I've always believed in politics we should be ourselves as, as hard as possible. But that really does mean deciding who we want to be. Are we going to keep our promises? Are we going to follow through on the decision of the referendum and do what we said in our manifesto? In terms of what it means for the future direction of the Conservative Party, obviously the headline is that the Brexit Party have done incredibly well and they're the runaway winners of the night. But when you look at the total vote share, actually anti-Brexit parties took 40.4% of the vote and pro-Brexit 34.9%. Well, the first thing is I'm very sorry we've lost such great MEPs, but I'm afraid the numbers you've just used are pure propaganda. I just tweeted it out. If you add in the Conservative Party, which is, of course, for leaving the European Union and just leaving the Labour Party as, as being undecided, you still get uh, leave outstripping. I mean, remake. admittedly, yes, obviously, it is a murky picture when you try to divide it's a murky picture when the, the BBC what was going on the in the minds. Well, no, what, I mean, okay, well, what I've added up specifically are the parties that are on the side of Remain specifically versus No Deal. Leave it, leave so it. people so that, can go so that and look at my down. Twitter feed. I've just retweeted Stand Up for Brexit. They've re corrected the BBC's figures. If you add the Conservative Party in as a Leave Party, yeah. then the country just voted for Leave parties. But I'm afraid this, this is spin and propaganda. The, both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party stood on manifestos to take us out of the European Union. And we can't now reinvent the platforms and the mandates the platforms on which we stood and the mandate that we have. So the Conservative Party strategy obviously was try to try to keep supporters, uh, natural Tory party supporters on both sides of the Brexit debate 
on in the camp. Yeah, so the Conservative, well, insofar as the Conservative Party had a campaign, it was to put pressure on people like me who didn't support the deal, indeed co colleagues who didn't support it at each of the three votes, uh, but it was asking people to vote for the, to, the public to vote for the deal, and they didn't. There's no mandate whatsoever for this withdrawal agreement out of this election result, and I think we all need to learn from that. This decision now, I'm afraid, is crystallising into leaving without a withdrawal agreement, possibly on WTO terms, but offering the EU a set of treaties to match the offer they made to us last year, or remain. And you know, the Conservative Party, if it's to survive, needs to be willing to leave the European Union with treaties tabled to the EU to match their offer. But what these results, I mean, you sort of say about people trying to use the results to indicate what, what they think, you know, that they say about the, the country and what they want. But what these results do not say is that there is a majority for a no-deal Brexit. Well, one of the things about these results is, of course, they're on a low turnout. And I've had leave voter after leave voter say to me, what's the point of voting? Well, of course, they can see now what the point is, because we're all poring it, it, over the entrails of these results on a but, I mean, low we've, we've turnout. We've got what we've got, and there's no point wondering about what people might have voted for had they voted. But and what we've got is no well, I'm trying to encourage people to vote in, in elections. This, in this, in, well, I mean, that obviously that would be that's a good thing, but that's a separate argument. In terms of looking at these results today and what they indicate, there isn't a majority in the country, according to these results, for a no-deal Brexit. The, sta the, the standout fact of this result is the Brexit party being the runaway winners. If this had been a general election on first past the post, we wouldn't have won any seats, and they'd be governing the country. And that should wait, be a wake-up call to all of us. And their policy is, of course, a no-deal Brexit. So again, I'm afraid one of the problems the public are going to have as we pour over these results throughout the day is there's something in these results for everybody. But the winners of this election, I'm, in a sense, I'm sorry to say, because they shouldn't have uh, ever taken place, is the Brexit party, and their policy is to reject the withdrawal agreement and leave with no deal. Now, that is a challenge to the Conservative Party. What are we going to do to keep our promises? What are we going to do if we're going to keep Jeremy Corbyn out of power? OK, so they're obviously two I mean there's the question of who will lead the party so first of all clear it up for us because I saw you've been speaking saying that you're not ruling out standing but um, obviously there's already Dominic Raab and, and Boris Johnson in the same camp as you. Boris and Dom are very talented people and they are clearly in the lead but the reality is that the third presentation of the deal they voted for it and I did not that's caused people to ask me to stand so I'm going to think about that seriously through the week by the time we get to next weekend I'll have made a decision but I'm very conscious we've got too many Eurosceptic candidates, candidates uh, already in the air. We, it really would be better to, uh, to converge on one or two. But I think through this week, as things move fast, we'll have to think carefully about what we all do. Are you saying that Boris and Dominic would not be credible candidates and therefore... No, you I'm not going to go one. down that path whatsoever. Both Dom and Boris have got great credentials and great records. But it just is a matter of fact that they voted for the deal at the, the third go, and I did not. That's caused many activists outside to ask me to stand, and indeed when some When will you MPs. be clear on this? Because you've been skirting around it for a well, while. You've been a Members of the media have been asking me whether I'm standing, and the truth is I need to decide in the course of this week. Events will move fast, various polls will emerge. On Friday, my odds collapsed from 150 to 1 down to as low as 25 to 1 on becoming the next leader. So I need to think very carefully about what is happening. Look how events develop over the week. Is a leader, whether it's you, Boris Johnson or Dominic Raab for the Tory party, standing where you're standing, a recipe for us having another general election? Because there is no way Parliament would support what you would want the country to do. So I don't accept that at all. So just to be clear, what I want the country to do is land a relationship of the character that the European Union offered to us last year. Defence and security cooperation, a great free trade agreement, participation in institutions of research, innovation, education, culture, some other bits. Okay. You know, this is a this great relationship. Like a, this sounds like a leadership pitch. No, it's the <laughs> offer the EU made to us and that's okay. what I'd like to deliver, but we'll have to get there a different way. Steve Baker, thank you very much You're indeed. Welcome. Well, uh, there are obviously questions as well for Labour and how they interpret this these results going forward. Uh, the Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell says the Labour Party cannot hide from what he called the hit we took last night. He tweeted, bringing people together when there's such a divide was never going to be easy. Now we face the prospect of Brexiteer, a Brexiteer extremist as Tory leader and the threat of no deal. We must unite our party and country by taking the issue back to the people in a public vote. So let's go to Leeds. We can speak to Richard Bergen, Labour MP for Leeds East and the Shadow Justice Secretary. Thank Thank you for joining us. So is that confirmation that Labour is now going to push for a second referendum? 
we've got to be clear about the increased danger of a disastrous no-deal Brexit and all the damage that would mean for the economy, for jobs and living standards, becoming a reality because of the changed circumstances uh, in the Conservative Party. That could be Boris Johnson pushing it, it could be someone else pushing it. But we need, as a Labour Party, to use every mechanism to stop that no-deal Brexit. And that means a general election or a public vote or no confidence motion so if it takes a public vote to stop a disastrous no deal brexit then of course we'll pursue that and, and when will that become clear well events are unfolding on a day-to-day -day basis but i think what we need to do uh, across the opposition parties really is to step up uh, to the plate of explain to the public exactly what a no deal brexit means including opening up our economy uh, to the kind of free market madness that characterises the United States of America, including opening up our NHS potentially to multinational corporations from the United States of America, because okay, I think sorry, the I EU mean, election. So, so results... you're going, you're going, uh, you know, the next step down the road, which is talking about the arguments that there would be in the event of having to specifically campaign against a No Deal Brexit, which sounds to me like you're saying this is what we will do in the event of a referendum. What I'm saying is we need to stop a no-deal Brexit or a disastrous Tory Brexit pushed by Boris Johnson or someone else happening. And we need to use any mechanism to stop that. Uh, a no-confidence motion uh, in the new Prime Minister who really has no de democratic legitimacy when he or she takes over without a general election, pushing for uh, a general election. And yes, uh, a public vote to stop a disastrous Tory Brexit or a no-deal Brexit. Is, I think is, Labour, is Labour going to now be the party of Remain? which some in the Labour Party were saying it was. It, I mean, that was sort of, I suppose, an aspiration. Tom Watson, for instance, said uh, previously that, that Labour is now the party of Remain. Well, in the referendum, we campaigned uh, to remain in but reform uh, the European Union. Uh, and the, so, last... and the, t the Tories campaigned to remain as well. At uh, the last the general referendum. election, uh, we said that we accepted and respected the result of the referendum. But the danger of a no deal Brexit pushed by Boris Johnson or someone else is becoming increasingly, increasingly likely. If there were, for example, a public vote and that public vote was between um, a no deal Brexit and remain, if they were the only two options, then clearly the Labour Party party couldn't back uh, a no deal Brexit in such circumstances because we believe it would be bad for the economy and bad for the living standards of the majority of people in this country. I mean there's been no mention from uh, Jeremy Corbyn overnight from John McDonnell of now uh, seeing through the result of the referendum. So, which does make it look like the party is going to become the party of Remain officially fairly soon. Well, if we were in government today, we would try and negotiate a decent deal and try and bring people together who voted Leave and who voted Remain. Uh, we're not in government yet. We think a general election is right and democratic should uh, take place sooner rather than later. Now that Theresa May is gone, there'll be uh, a Tory Prime Minister uh, on the way who's actually elected by... Um, not very many Conservative Party members, certainly not supported or decided upon by uh, the country. Uh, if a general election takes place in the usual way as a Democratic Party, we'll decide upon uh, our policy, whether that general election takes place before an exit from the European Union, or whether that general uh, election takes place uh, after a disastrous uh, Tory back to no deal Brexit from the European Do Union. Do you accept that what we have seen here, though, is that the strategy that you've been outlining and that, that previously was to keep talking about what we would do if we were in power has failed and trying to keep everybody on side has failed. The people out there want clarity. That's what they voted for last night. I think bringing people together is the right thing to do. I don't think you can extrapolate from our deeply disappointing results in the EU elections uh, to a general election. For example, uh, Nigel Farage's UKIP uh, back in 2014 came top in those EU elections, but the year after in the general election only got one uh, MP. Uh, I don't think, as much as I'd love it to happen, I don't think the Conservatives are going to get less than 10% at the next general election as they did in the EU elections uh, this uh, week. I think it became the EU referendum inevitably on a l much lower turnout, uh, so the EU elections became inevitably a bit of a proxy referendum uh, on a much lower turnout than the referendum, on a much lower turnout than a general election. So I don't think 
that so we can directly jump from the outcome of these EU elections to a general election. We're ahead in the polls for a general election at the moment. I'm confident we can win a general election, which should happen sooner rather than later. But is it a good night uh, for Labour? Of course not. The Tories have had their worst results for 200 years, and we're back to our vote share from the 2009 EU elections, which is clearly disappointing. And we do need to listen, and we do need to discuss things with people in the party, with trade union affiliates, and of course with voters, both who voted Remain and Leave across the country. Richard Bergen, thank you very much. So, Ben, lots of soul-searching is going to be going on here at Westminster in the coming days and weeks. Of course, the Tories are already heading for a leadership contest, which will decide the future direction of the party, but there are serious questions being asked for Labour too in terms of what their strategy is going to be. So politics continues to be interesting and uh, unexpected in terms of what's happening. For now, I'll hand you back to the studio, Ben. Very interesting indeed. Yeah, thanks, Joanna. Um, let's pursue it a little bit further with the political scientist Professor Sir John Curtis, who's been up all night and is still with us. Uh, John, thanks very much for being with us. Um, well, we were listening to that interview with Steve Baker. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of different people interpreting these election results very differently. What is your interpretation? I mean, because many people saw this in some ways as a as another referendum, really. People voting, you know, leave and remain through the parties. Well, it, it certainly was another referendum insofar as a, a substantial body of voters opted to vote for either parties that said we should leave without a deal, parties that otherwise uh, haven't done terribly well in elections recently, or for parties that said we should definitely have a second referendum, and again, including the Liberal Democrats who haven't been doing that well recently, and they have forsaken our traditional two parties, um, who are being accused either of failing to deliver and or um, presenting too much of a fudge. So clearly, during the course of the campaign, support for Conservative and Labour fell and voters used this referendum, many of them, to express their views about those parties. That inevitably then, you can, you can take the numbers of this and frankly you can, you can convert them to whichever argument you wish to support. So, uh, for example, you can take all the votes that were cast for parties that are supposedly in favour of Brexit, which at these days still includes the Labour Party, and you conclude that people voted in favour of Brexit. Or you can say, well, actually, the Labour Party is, roughly speaking, still in, uh, not opposed to a referendum. So take all the parties that might contemplate a referendum, and you say a majority of people voted for a referendum. My own view is that probably the safest uh, uh, statement to make is that the public are very, well, in the way in which they voted, mm. the public found themselves to be extremely evenly divided between these two options. 35% voted for parties that both are in favour of no deal and where virtually all of that vote comes from those who voted leave. And on the other side of the fence, 35% of people voted for parties that A, well, clearly in favour of a second referendum and those parties' voters are known to count, consist almost entirely of Remain voters. Now, some people would want to add the Nationalist parties to that total and they then get it up to 40%, but we know from the polling evidence that the Scottish National Party gets about a third of its vote from Leavers. So, shall I suggest that the safest course of action mm. and the one real clear description is, frankly, we are divided, we are evenly, more or less evenly divided, but above all, and what's more crucial, we are polarised. Yeah. We are polarised between those two extreme options of no deal and second referendum. And that, I mean, Nigel Farage, although in a sense the winner on the night, the, the Brexit party, the winner on the night, saying that effectively this is a reflection of the referendum result, the 52, 48%. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, I mean, there are two ways of reading. I mean, you know, there is no doubt that, you know, the Brexit party did well, or came first, did well, etc., etc. But we should remember that what the Brexit Party is doing is articulating and expressing, albeit very effectively, the views of a section of the electorate that represents less than half of the electorate. We know from polling evidence that somewhere between a half and a third of Leave voters, so a half and two thirds of Leave voters, are, are in favour of or willing to accept no deal. And the 32% that the UKIP got is consistent with that evidence, essentially. It takes 64% of the Leave voters and it goes down to 32% of, of the whole electorate. Um, so uh, it's, we certainly can't argue on the basis of this, as some want to argue, that this is very clear expression 
that the public wish to leave without a deal, 35% is not a majority. And equally, whether you call it 35% or 40%, mm. you cannot argue that a majority of the public expressed a clear view in favour of a second referendum. And to that extent, at least, the honest truth is that both sides still have to make progress to convince public opinion in a subject on which, above all, we are just deeply divided. And what are the implications for a possible general election? Well, I think so far as what we might call a voluntary general election is concerned, i.e., what are the, what's the probability that the next Conservative Prime Minister by the autumn will decide that actually he or she is going in a position to hold a general election which might make the arithmetic of the House of Commons easier to get Brexit through? A party that's just got 9% of the vote, that's lost the majority of its voters to another party on the grounds that it's failed to deliver Brexit is unlikely to be in that position. Now, not, a lot of the people who voted for the Brexit party would vote for the Conservatives in general election, but an awful lot would not. And I suspect that many of those would not come back unless and until Brexit has been delivered. They went from UKIP to the Conservatives once because they thought Theresa May could deliver. She hasn't delivered and they're unlikely to go back again. Now, that said, clearly also, um, it's, and this isn't simply a cause for the election, given that we're now having the prospect of a prime minister who might be more willing to contemplate no deal than the uh, previous prime, or the current prime minister, Theresa May, uh, was, you know, maybe, maybe they do try to get it through the House of Commons, but the trouble is it looks as though that if a prime minister were to try to do that, the House of Commons ultimately would use the nuclear weapon of bringing that government down through a vote of confidence, which would precipitate a general election. So it all depends very much on how the new prime minister can play his or her hand. If they can deliver Brexit, then maybe they can have an election they can win. If they can't, I suspect they will want to stay away from the electorate for as long as possible. What would you say about the phenomenon of the Brexit party? It's, only, it's a party that's only been around for a few weeks. Yes. It didn't have a manifesto. Yes. And here it is, the winner. But it is led by a gentleman who is extremely well known to be associated with um, uh, uh, the Eurosceptic view. And in a sense, I mean, we saw this the moment that Nigel Farage founded his party, virtually every UKIP voter switched towards the Brexit party. So I think, in effect, we have to think of the Brexit party as UKIP reincarnate rather than a wholly new invention uh, that's uh, come, come from nowhere. And to be honest, if it were not Nigel Farage's creation, it would not be doing anything, anything like as well as it did. Mm. And it's, a, it's another testament to Mr Farage's unique ability to articulate the views of a section of our society in a very effective way, which has had a very dramatic impact on British politics. John Curtis, thank you so much for being with us. Professor John Curtis there. Well, uh, we're going to hear from our correspondents in Scotland and Northern Ireland, where counting continues in a moment. But first, let's uh, just take a closer look at the results in Wales. The Brexit Party won the largest share of the vote with almost a third, 32%. Plaid Cymru gained second place with 20% of the vote. Labour came in third, uh, which when we look at the change in the share of the vote since the last election in 2014, you can see is a big loss for the party. They've lost 13 percentage points in Wales. And the Conservatives also down compared to last time round. UKIP also performed badly, down 24%, uh, down 24 points. So when translated into MEPs in Wales, the Brexit party have two, Plaid Cymru and Labour both have one. And you can see there that the Conservatives and UKIP each lost an MEP. Well, our Wales correspondent Arwen Jones is in Cardiff. Uh, just talk us through then the results, the implications and the reaction. Yes, Ben, as you're saying, it's a, it's a reflection, really, what's happened elsewhere in the UK with the Brexit Party gaining around about a third of the vote. But it's that competition, that battle between Labour and Plaid Cymru, which is very interesting uh, as a result from last night. Uh, if you look at the context here, it's that almost vice-like rip that Labour has had on politics in Wales for the best part of a century, topping the polls in 38 of the last 39 elections held in Wales and last night in third place behind Plaid Cymru, the first time the Nationalist Party has uh, defeated Labour in a Wales-wide election in its 90-year history. Adam Price, Plaid Cymru's leader, saying that the tectonic plates have shifted in Welsh politics. We'll have to wait to see about that. But there's another element here in Wales, of course, which is behind me there in the Assembly Senedd building. Labour is a party of government here. Labour has the first minister in Wales in Mark Drakeford who has stuck very close 
closely to Jeremy Corbyn's message uh, on Brexit, not calling outright for a uh, another referendum uh, and he has been criticised for that. Now some senior assembly members in, in the World Assembly behind me and senior Welsh members of Parliament saying there now needs to be a rethink on the party's position on Brexit in Wales. In Wales here there's a Brexit minister in Jeremy Miles saying we need to have a rethink now. The international minister in Elliot Morgan who has said this morning there needs to be a rethink. So Mark Drakeford, Wales' Labour first minister coming under increasing pressure today to change away from the UK Labour a message and having a distinctly Welsh message uh, to give to voters uh, on Brexit. Owen, thank you very much indeed. Sorry about the quality of the line there. Uh, let's go to Scotland then and our Scotland correspondent Lorna Gordon is in Glasgow for us where they're still counting the votes. Uh, but Lorna, just give us the story of the night there. Yeah, the Western Isles still to declare. They don't count on a Sunday, but their result is due in probably between 11 and 12 o'clock this morning. But I don't think it'll really affect the overall result as it stands at the, the moment, which is that the SNP carried the vote here in Scotland. It's a, a very different situation uh, to, say, Wales that we've just heard from. Uh, the SNP fought its campaign on a very clear message that Scotland's for Europe, and it really did seem to hit home. They are on track for their best ever European election uh, results, uh, increasing the number of SNP MPs uh, likely to increase from two to three, and that's of a total of six. Now, the leader of the SNP, Nicola Sturgeon, has called this an historic victory, with Scotland rejecting Brexit once again. The Liberal Democrats also on course to win a seat, although, of course, they take a different position on the other constitutional question here in Scotland, that of Scottish uh, independence. Uh, important, though, uh, to note that the Brexit party does look set to win one seat here in Scotland, that perhaps reflecting the fact that around a million people voted for Brexit in that European uh, referendum three years ago. As to the Conservatives, they also look on course to win one seat. Um, not a great night for them, but their vote did hold up better than in the rest of the UK, so they will take some comfort from that. As to Labour, dismal night for them. Five years ago they came a close second here uh, in the, the European elections. This time around their vote uh, collapsed to less than 10% of the total. But a night uh, for, for the losers, I think Labour the loser for the winners, uh, the SNP uh, had a great night overall. Interesting to see how that affects uh, their momentum going forward in this arguments over a second uh, referendum on independence. The SNP Westminster leader Ian Blackford has suggested that the result in this election has cemented its case for a second referendum on independence in the event of a no-deal Brexit. All right, Lorna, thank you very much indeed. And uh, we can go to our Ireland correspondent now, uh, Chris Page, who's at a count in Macrofelt. Uh, looks pretty busy there behind you, Chris. What's going on? certainly is, Ben, yes. The results may be in for most of the rest of the UK, but here in Northern Ireland, the counting's only really just beginning. The process has been underway for uh, just over uh, an hour now. Three seats in the European Parliament are up for grabs here. One held by the Democratic Unionist Party, who are strongly pro-Brexit. One held by Sinn Féin, who are anti-Brexit. The third by the Ulster Unionist Party, who uh, were for remaining in the EU at the time of the 2016 referendum, but since then they've said that the result of that referendum should be honoured so the UK should leave. Now the DUP and Sinn Féin more or less guaranteed to hold on to their seats but that third seat is a lot more unpredictable. The Ulster Unionist politician who'd held uh, the party's European parliamentary seat for 30 years has retired so they're running a new candidate uh, this time round and the other parties in contention for that seat are the Nationalist SDLP and the Cross Community Alliance Party both strongly anti-Brexit. The traditional unionist voice who are passionate Brexiteers also, the Green Party are keen to see how well they will do uh, in the wake of their successful performance across the rest of the UK and indeed uh, the rest of the European Union, not least uh, in the Irish Republic. Turnout in Northern Ireland stronger than in the rest of the country at 45%, perhaps reflecting the fact that Brexit, one way or another, would be set to affect uh, Northern Ireland uh, more than most places. So counting just beginning, it's a form of proportional representation, the single transferable vote, which means it's going to be a pretty long process. For us, and uh, you'll be there for, for us throughout the day. Chris Page, thank you very much indeed. And our correspondent, Tim Muffet, uh, is at a 
boot sale in Sutton Coalfield, finding out what the buyers and sellers there make of these EU election results. Tim. Yeah, good morning to you from Lee Marston. Bank holiday car boot sale amongst the bargain hunters and the declutterers. Many people with views about what has happened in the European elections overnight. The West Midlands constituency saw three Brexit MEPs elected, one Labour, one Lib Dem, one Green, one Conservative. But really it's that Brexit party performance which has really caught people's attention. Donna, what did you make of what happened overnight? I didn't know anything about it till this morning. Um, I don't think the European election really has much relevance to me. Are you pleased that the Brexit party has done so well? Yeah, I think I would be, yeah. Yeah, I think we've voted on it and nobody's given their opinion yet. Nothing's actually happened, so it'd be good to see if something now changes. Donna, thanks ever so much indeed. This area is an interesting one because in the 2016 election, um, about 59% of people in the West Midlands voted to leave. In Sutton Coalfield itself, there was around 52%. Um, Brian, what did you make of the results from the European elections? Uh, I thought they were sort of fairly predictable, really, because the two parties that had a clear, clear policy were Nigel Farage's Brexit party, and the name speaks for itself, and the Lib Dems who said, no, we're firmly in favour of Remain. They're the only people who came across with a clear message. The Labour Party, I have no idea what they stand for. The Tory party have demonstrated that um, they really don't sing from the same hymn sheet at all. Interesting stuff, Brian. Thanks very much indeed for your Thank thoughts. You. Good luck with your bargain hunting today. Thank Let's have a quick chat to Michael as well. Michael, what did you make of, of what happened? Did you vote? No, for the first time in my life I didn't vote, um, the reason being I was an ardent Remainer and as much as Mr Farage I admire him and his leadership skills, I thought personally it might be a little bit hypocritical. Interesting stuff, so in terms of the reaction to the result overall, what would you say, it was what you, it's what you expected? It's what we expected and I think it's um, time that we had a bit of strong leadership and it will only move on and show that um, the lack of leadership over the last few years has just oh, yeah. proven not to be positive. Okay, Michael, thanks ever so much indeed. Pleasure. Good luck indeed with your sales today. Thank Hope they you go very well. Much. There's plenty of people here this morning. It's a real popular event, this uh, bank holiday car boot sale. A lot of browsing going, a lot of perusing, and a lot of digesting as well of the European election results that took place. Tim, thank you very much indeed. Tim Muffet there for us. Uh, let's go back to Joanna at Westminster for more political reaction from there. Thank you very much, Ben. Well, the Greens have made gains in this election. They have seen their best performance since 1989, coming in ahead of the Tory party. Let's talk to Jonathan Bartley, the party's co-leader. Thank you for joining us. Do you think that this surge is off the back of basically people seeing this as, as effectively another referendum on Brexit and they've gone for the Greens because you're uh, Remain? I think it's bigger than that. It clearly, there's an element of being very, very unequivocally Remain and standing for a people's vote. But if you look at what's happening right across Europe, there is a green wave. You know, Germans coming up into second place and similar pattern there across Europe decline of the two big parties uh, people wanting more choice and also you know people recognizing that the climate crisis uh, is full square upon us uh, we've got 11 years to turn this around um, the school strikes extinction rebellion have really brought that issue to the fore uh, and the Green Party offering something which I think other Remain parties haven't been offering. You know, a lot of Labour voters have come to the Greens because they wouldn't go to the Lib Dems because of the Lib Dem support for austerity. So the Greens you know, offering a very comprehensive package to people. We're obviously in a very unusual position in that these votes have come in an election that wasn't supposed to happen. We were supposed to have left Europe by now. Who knows how long these British MEPs may sit for if we if we do go out on the 31st of October. Um, so in terms of green impact here in Westminster, nothing has changed. I mean, nothing's changed for any of the parties here in Westminster. So where do things go from here in this country? Well, I mean, with regard to the Green Party specifically, we were coming first in a number of councils around the country, places like Brighton, Bristol and Norwich. Uh, we've seen our Westminster polling intention go you know, rocket up as well, much beyond our record 2015 election result. Uh, clearly, though, overall, this sends a very, very strong message. Uh, Remain People's Vote parties out polling Brexit and UKIP uh, very clearly. So, you know, that's going to make uh, minds at Westminster very, very concentrated. And it still seems, you know, you can change the Conservative Party leader, you can change the Prime Minister, but that doesn't change the parliamentary arithmetic. It doesn't change the dilemma over not being able to deliver Brexit. And, you know, there's an even more compelling case, I think, now to have that people's vote that we've been asking for. The, the fragmented vote for Remain um, has 
been okay for all the individual parties in these elections because of course it's proportional representation so you've come out with seven MEPs at Westminster you've got one MEP share of the vote doesn't translate in the same way here um, if we were to head into another general election and we we may well do that sooner rather than later it's not clear um, how many candidates would you expect to be able to field how much do you think you could how high do you think you could punch we've heard from Nigel Farage this morning from the Brexit party saying he would expect now to field candidates in every constituency which is remarkable if if that's managed by a, a brand new party I can't say the numbers off the top of my head but yeah. certainly hundreds um, we'd be certainly looking to maximize our vote but the important thing I think to recognize is that people are more and more voting with their heart, sending a message in elections. And you can see the long-term trend from the 1950s. You know, people voted for the two big parties. About 90% of us did. Uh, it's gone down and down and down. And we're seeing the two big parties get their lowest vote share ever in recent polling for a Westminster election, indicating that people want change. You know, the country's divided right now, but I think everyone's united in believing that the political system is broken and it needs urgent reform. And people are sending very, very clear messages by voting for parties like the Greens that that reform is needed and long overdue. But as I say, we still would come back to the situation that has ever been thus in this country, which is that in the Westminster, Westminster system, you wouldn't get a result like this because of the fact it's not proportional representation. Well, I think, past the you know, let's, let's watch and see what happens because I detect you know, a really big change. Uh, people really saying the system is broken, we have to change it. And uh, because we get in those first places you know, in council elections, off the back of uh, big council election results, three or four, uh, month, uh, weeks ago, where it is a first past the post system, but we doubled the number of councillors. So people recognise if you vote green, you get green, and that makes a big difference. Jonathan Bartley, thank you very much indeed. Well, uh, we are going to have much more political reaction here at Westminster throughout the rest of the morning. For now, I'll hand you back to Ben. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, let's just take a closer look at the results in London, where the pro Remain parties uh, polled pretty well. Let's. Uh, just guide you through them. The Liberal Democrats, the main winners in the European elections in London, with 27% of the vote, beating Labour into second place. Uh, the Brexit Party came third, then the Greens. The Conservatives came in fifth with 8% of the vote. And when that is translated into the number of MEPs in the region, the Liberal Democrats gained three MEPs. Both the Brexit Party and Labour had two candidates selected, although you can see that Labour also lost two MEPs. Uh, the Green Party took the remaining seat. It means the Conservative Party no longer has any MEPs in London, having lost the two seats that it won in the uh, 2014 European Parliament elections. Well, let's talk now uh, about the London results and the national uh, results with Ben Habib, who's one of the two newly elected MEPs for the uh, Brexit Party in London. Thank you very much for being with us. Good morning. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, what, what's your reading of the results? Because Nigel Farage was saying, in effect, it's not really a surprise. It's just a reflection of the referendum result of three years ago. The 52-48% split, he said, has yeah. been mirrored by these results. Is that how you see it? Yeah, that's how I see it. You know, we've had three elections now in the last three years. We had the referendum, which leave won. We had the general election in 2017, which effectively leave won because 80% of the constituency <coughs> of Parliament was was you know supported the referendum and we've had this these euro elections and again leave has won so we've had three elections which evidence the nation's desire to leave albeit on that sort of split that you described but doesn't it just show what a divided country we are over europe is this actually a mandate do you think for a no deal brexit well we stood for a no deal brexit in these elections um We've given, or the government rather, has given the uh, opportunity of, de of a deal of goodwill. It came up with a withdrawal agreement which the EU has declined to renegotiate and which Westminster has rejected three times. So I think it's safe to say that that's a bad deal. And given that that's a bad deal, we ought to be leaving without a deal. Do you think this, if there were a general election, that this sort of result would in any way be mirrored? That, in other words, that the Brexit party would be winning lots and lots of seats around the country. Yeah, I don't think this is a protest vote. I think people are absolutely fed up, not just with the government, but with Parliament itself. And um, as we've said, we're here to change politics for good. And I think if a general election were to be held tomorrow, I think the Brexit party may well be forming a government. OK, Ben Habib, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you for your time.
Uh, well, our correspondent Hugh Schofield's in Paris for us uh, with a look at the results uh, there in France. Hugh. Yeah, uh, and uh, the big two uh, have come out way ahead of the rest of the pack here. The big two being Emmanuel Macron's party and the winner, um, Marine Le Pen's national rally. In, in, in effect, they were, they were, the real battle was between those two, uh, the rest of them being left way, way um, in the rear. Uh, and the, the, the victory went to Marine Le Pen's National Rally Party, but only just. She got about 23%, uh, Macron got 22%, and then way, way down, we have the Greens on 13%, and below them, the centre-right on 8%, the centre-left on, on 6%. So when you're talking about the big two parties in Britain doing badly, spare a thought for the big two parties, or the old big two parties in France who've, who've been wiped out. They've got 15% between them. It is, of course, a, a victory for Marine Le Pen, and she is uh, today uh, in in ju jubilant mode, but it is not a wipeout by any means for, for Emmanuel Macron, and he can draw a lot of solace from the result because it does tend to confirm his view of European politics, French politics, as being between people like him and people like Marine Le Pen. Hugh, thank you very much indeed. And we can also go to Germany and uh, join our correspondent Jenny Hill, who is there for us in Berlin. What is the story of the night, would you say, in Germany? I think there are two big stories. First of all, the big old parties, Angela Merkel's Conservatives and their coalition partners, the Social Democrats, have made pretty significant losses, particularly the Social Democrats who had a disastrous showing overnight. The second big story, though, is the surging popularity of the Green Party. They almost doubled their, um, their, their share of the, the vote on, on the last elections, um, really doing very well indeed. And I think that reflects two trends that we're seeing here in Germany. First of all, interest in climate change and environmental policy has really come to the forefront here. It tops the list of voters' concerns in the run-up to this vote. Um, secondly, um, it's all about the youth vote. Um, if you look at the breakdown of the figures, you can see that a significant proportion of support for the Greens came from younger voters and they're leeching away from those older, more established parties. Quick note about the far-right AFD. They didn't do as well um, as perhaps they'd hoped. They only made a small gain, though interestingly, if you look at the old eastern states in Germany, they are still rather strong there. Jenny, thank you very much indeed. We're going to have a full roundup of all the results at the top of the hour. But uh, let's just go back to my colleague Joanna Gosling, who's at Westminster, with more reaction. Thank you very much, Ben. With me, Arnold Menon, who's director of UK in a changing Europe. Well, Europe has changed in terms of the makeup of the, uh, par the Parliament. But what's changed here? Well. The political landscape has changed, definitely, because the Lib Dems have, as long as, as well as the Brexit Party, a sense of momentum now. That really matters in politics. But actually, curiously enough, if you look at the bigger picture, what's changed with Brexit? Remarkably little. We're still in a country that's divided down the middle, as last night showed all too clearly. We still have a parliament that can't make up its mind. So it's still virtually impossible to see how we break the Brexit logjam general election? Well, I'd always argue that a general election was one way of doing this because it would force the parties to have a policy and it would force the people to choose. But actually, one of the implications of last night is both the big parties now fear another encounter with the electorate almost more than they fear anything else. If a uh, no-deal Brexit candidate comes in as leader of the Conservative Party, is that going to be a recipe for a general election? Because obviously we know what the arithmetic is par in Parliament is. Well, it'll be a recipe for instability because my sense then is if we get a Prime Minister who's determined to try and push us towards no deal, a number of Conservative MPs would seriously consider voting against their own government in a vote of no confidence. That then triggers this two-week process. We see if we can make it, get another government that can command the uh, support of the House. And if not, then yes, after 14 days, we're having a general election. Anand Menon, thank you very much. We will be here throughout the day with more analysis and reaction. For now, let's catch up with the weather. The sun has just come out here in Westminster. Let's see how it's looking everywhere. Simon King has the details. Yeah, thanks, Joanna. We've had some sunshine this morning across eastern and southern parts of the UK. Further north and west, though, a bit more mixed. We've had quite a few showers this morning in northwest England and Wales in particular. Uh, quite a few showers across Northern Ireland. And through the rest of today, we'll continue with these showers, which will be heavy, perhaps even thundery, and they'll eventually track their way into eastern and southern parts during this afternoon. Quite blustery conditions, but it's a westerly wind for England and Wales, whereas further north, it's a northerly wind. So feeling quite chilly today 
compared to the last few days. Temperatures 10, 12 degrees Celsius, whereas we'll get to about 19 degrees in the southeast of England. Through tonight, those showers will continue to move their way through. Again, they could be heavy in places through the night and temperatures getting down to around about 6 to 10 degrees. And then into Tuesday, showers again, but I think these will be mostly confined towards eastern Scotland, down the eastern side of England. Again, could be heavy, maybe even thundery. Further west, you'll see something a bit drier and sunnier compared to today, but it's going to feel quite cool again for many of us. Bye-bye. You're watching a BBC News EU election special. With the Brexit party, a clear winner in the poll, the Liberal Democrats taking second place and a very tough night for the Conservatives and Labour. The Brexit party, formed only six weeks ago, are the big winners, gaining almost a third of the vote and 28 MEPs. We have got a mandate now and we want the government to include us in their negotiating team. We have got to get ready for leaving the European Union on October the 31st. There's an awful lot we can do. The Liberal Democrats who campaign to stop Brexit come second with around 20% of the vote. And the Green Party makes significant gains, posting their best performance for 30 years. I'm Joanna Gosling at Westminster, where the two main parties have suffered heavy losses. Labour fall to third place overall, with less than 15% of the vote, prompting pressure on Jeremy Corbyn's approach to Brexit. We went into an election where the most important issue was what was, our, what was our view on leaving the European Union and we were not clear about it. We were not clear on the one single thing that people wanted to hear. The Conservatives are pushed into fifth place with an historic low of less than 10% of the vote. The Home Secretary says the results are hugely disappointing and another minister says it is time to rethink their strategy. It's a wake-up call to my colleagues in Parliament that we have to deliver on the instruction the British people gave us in 2016 in the Brexit referendum. In Scotland, the SNP have dominated the poll, winning 38% of the vote. And in Wales, Labour are pushed into third place behind the Brexit party and Plaid Cymru. And we'll bring you all the results and the picture across Europe, where turnout is up and the traditional parties have lost out to smaller ones. Hello, good morning and welcome to this BBC News EU election special. Well, in a major blow for the largest parties at Westminster, the Brexit Party have emerged as the clear winner in the poll for a new European Parliament. Formed only six weeks ago, Nigel Farage's party have won 28 seats so far and they've received almost a third of the share of the vote. Both Labour and the Tories posted some of their worst results ever while the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, who both oppose Brexit, have increased their vote and seats. Now, the Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, said the results were, quote, hugely disappointing and a verdict on Brexit. With 10 out of 12 regions declared, let's take a look for you now at the results in a little more detail. And it is the Brexit party that gains the largest share of the vote, as you can see there, almost a third, 32%. The Liberal Democrats took second place with 20%. That's up 13 points compared to their result in the last EU elections of 2014. Labour, they came third with 14%. That's down 11 points on last time round. The Greens increased their support, gaining 12% of the vote. The Conservatives fell to a historic low fifth place in the poll and just 9% of the vote. Now, although we're still waiting for the final results in Scotland, the SNP have polled strongly, while UKIP's vote fell heavily to just 3%. The New Change UK party also failed to make an impact. 73 seats in the European Parliament were up for grabs, with the Brexit party so far winning 28. Liberal Democrats have won 15. 
They gained just one in 2014. Labour now have 10 MEPs, losing eight. The Greens have more than doubled their seats with seven MEPs, up four. And the impact on the Conservative Party is clear when it comes to seats. They've got just three MEPs. That is down 15. Clyde Cymru have won one seat after beating Labour in Wales. So the final results in Scotland will be declared later this morning and counting in Northern Ireland starts today. Our first report comes from our political correspondent Nick Erdley and a warning that his report does contain some flash photography. A vote that wasn't supposed to take place to a parliament we're supposed to have left, a result that shows the country is still bitterly divided. The big winners, two parties with very different but very clear messages on Brexit. Brexit, Brexit now! Nigel Farage's Brexit party topped the poll with almost a third of the vote. The reason, of course, is very obvious. We voted to leave in a referendum. We were supposed to do so on March the 29th, and we haven't. The Liberal Democrats, with their anti-Brexit message, had a big night too, coming second across the UK. Every vote for the Liberal Democrats is a vote to stop Brexit. For the two parties that normally dominate British politics, it was a disaster. The Conservatives were thumped, finishing fifth with less than 10% of the vote. Three years ago, the country voted to leave. It's three years on and we haven't left. And inevitably, therefore, people were going to be drawn in a polarised way to the kind of single-issue pro- or anti-Brexit parties. Labour too were punished, finishing third with less than 15%. That'll spark a heated debate about whether it should now get fully behind another referendum. We're now going to find ourselves in a position where we will have a Tory leadership who will insist on either a bad deal or no deal at all. And I fear it will be no deal. And in those circumstances, we must be equally clear. And it will be a disaster for our country to have no deal. There should be a referendum and we should campaign to remain. <laughs> The Green vote was up too. They beat the Conservatives into fourth place. UKIP were wiped out and Change UK failed to make their mark. In Scotland, the SNP were miles ahead on almost 40%. The party will take three of the six seats there. In Wales, the Brexit party topped the poll. Plaid Cymru came second. Labour, a party who have dominated Welsh politics for a century, finished third. Northern Ireland counts today. It was a good night for parties who have taken a firm stand on Brexit, but voters are still split between parties who back leaving the EU as soon as possible and those who want another referendum and ultimately to stay. If you were hoping this would end the Brexit debate, you may well be disappointed. McGarry, BBC News. Uh, let's get more political reaction. There's plenty of it coming in. Uh, we can head to Westminster, where the two largest parties have had a very difficult night. Joanna's there for us, and Joanna, uh, lots of different people interpreting the results in lots of different ways. As <laughs> always, after the uh, results that we've been getting ever since the referendum, it's uh, all you'll hear again and again, well, these results clearly indicate dot, 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 whatever that particular person you're speaking to is in favour of. So in terms, though, of where the, the main parties go from here, they are going to have to work out a clear strategy um, on what they are going to be standing for in the future, because what these results do seem to have underlined is that the Tory and Labour strategies of trying to keep their traditional party voters who are on different sides of the Brexit debate on side with uh, talk of a compromise has failed and as we've been hearing it's the parties that have given a very clear indication of exactly where they stand on this whether it is a no deal or remain they are the parties that have done very well the Tory leadership race of course is already underway and last night is likely to have a big impact on how Theresa May's prospective successor pitches their Brexit solution Labour have also lost ground and there are also questions for Labour as to what its future policy should be and the indications are that it may be coalescing behind pushing for a second referendum. It's interesting that from uh, Jeremy Corbyn overnight we did not hear him talk about honouring the result of the referendum which has previously been the mantra from Labour. So let's bring in our assistant political editor Norman Smith. Um, so Norman there is a lot of soul-searching going on here in Westminster. 
There is, and of course everyone tries to extrapolate from the results something which sounds good for them. My own take is we spent the past three years going around in circles and have now ended up pretty much where we were at the time of the 2016 referendum, namely with a profoundly divided country where there seems frankly even less appetite for compromise following the last three years of trying to get a deal and getting pretty much uh, nowhere. So quite obviously Nigel Farage's Brexit party have done incredibly well getting almost a third of the vote from what you know a standing start in uh, six weeks winning in every area of England apart from London also winning uh, in Wales hoovering up true blue Tory seats, winning in uh, Theresa May's constituency, winning in Jeremy Hunt's constituency, winning in Boris Johnson's constituency, but then also shaking Jeremy Corbyn's cage by winning in, you know, Labour leave seats like Bolsover, Bassett Law, traditional Labour seats. And then on the other side, we have the Liberal Democrats bouncing back after their sort of bleak years to uh, take second place, doing spectacularly well in London, uh, overturning, you know, some of the key sort of Corbyn citadels like winning in Islington, Haringey, Camden. And I suppose the real question mark now for the Tory party is, how do they respond? And for Labour, how do they respond? In terms of the Tory party, there will be massive pressure now on the leadership candidates to pivot towards no deal because Nigel Farage has made absolutely clear if they do not, then he is prepared to stand his Brexit party in a general election. This is what he said this morning. There is much more change needed in British politics. The two-party system isn't fit for purpose. There are institutions like the House of Lords uh, that frankly have become an absolute parody of themselves. There's a lot of work to do beyond Brexit to modernise and change the shape of British politics. But our primary goal is to get this country to be independent and self-governing. If that doesn't happen, and if we don't leave on the 31st of October, then what you will see is the Brexit party stunning everybody at the next general election. Meanwhile, Labour have to decide how on earth do they get back those Labour voters who seem to desert them in droves for either the Liberal Democrats or uh, the Green Party. And we are, I think, beginning to see movement. Interesting this morning, uh, we've heard from John McDonnell, Diane Abbott overnight. Of course, we heard from Emily Thornberry before that, Tom Watson, all mooting the possibility that the party had to back a public vote. Now, uh, John McDonnell will say, well, I'm just talking about a general election, and if we can't get a general election, then yes, I am talking about another referendum. The reality, it seems to me, is no Tory leader is going to even consider another general election because based on this they would be annihilated, which means the only public vote which really has got much chance of getting lift off will be another referendum. Albeit at the moment, it seems the Liberal Democrats have sort of positioned themselves as the referendum party, the Remain party. At least that's what the message was from their president, Sal Brinton, this morning. People had written us off and said we couldn't recover. And I am so proud of our members, 100,000 members across the country who have worked hard, built up, helped us with a strong message. Hundreds of thousands of people who joined our Stop Brexit campaign, which resulted on Thursday in millions of people voting for us as the strongest Remain party. We've got our best ever European election results. And it's really, really encouraging for the future. Now, one of the Remain parties that didn't enjoy that sort of referendum bounce was the new Change UK party, who got around half a million votes, I think, but no MEPs. Their difficulties, though, I suspect, have only been compounded uh, by what looks like a row brewing between some of their MPs over whether they should have made the case for tactical voting with the Liberal Democrats before the election. Now, their interim leader, Heidi Allen, in an interview on Channel 4 News, did seem to back the idea of tactical voting, working with the Liberal Democrats. That, this morning, drew this rebuke from another of their MPs, Anna Subri. We are 11 members of Parliament that came from two political parties. We came together, we formed this new political party, a genuinely new political party, with a new approach to doing politics. And I'm, I'm very pleased that 600,000 people were good enough to go out and give us our support. I mean, if you look at that in terms of core vote and then compare it to the Conservatives, 
at 9%, and then the Labour Party at, what, 11 12%? That's their core vote. I think there's much hope for our future, and I'm looking forward to it. Now, what we didn't actually hear Anna Subri say there was what she uh, also said, which she thought it bizarre that the party's interim leader had mooted um, this idea of working with the Liberal Democrats. But clearly, they now face some pretty fundamental questions about how they go forward and how close they get to the Liberal Democrats. Thank you very much, Norman. Let's get some more reaction from the Conservative Party, joined here by the Conservative MP, Paul Scully. Thank Morning. you very much. Um, well, it couldn't have been much worse for your party, could it? It was a really bad evening, uh, no doubt about it. You know, it's something we've got to uh, understand, make no bones about the fact uh, uh, where we are. And we've already started to listen. You can see what happened the days before in the lead up to polling day and afterwards. Obviously, the um, Prime Minister's uh, fallen on a sword and... Uh, uh, and we've got to now choose a new leader, which will be the new Prime Minister, and actually get Brexit done. No deal Brexit? I think we've got to do everything we can do to get a deal. Um, but that's find exactly to... what they've been trying to do, and it's Yeah, failed. I know, but there were some, there, I think there were some key areas of disagreement that we can really see if we, see if we can work on the backstop in particular, uh, and those kind of areas that we just need to redouble our effort and see if there's any ground of flexibility. Which... It sounds like what has been gone over and well, over again. Well, it's not just and bringing back the, the same the thing again. The voters said, basically, in these results, we're sick of that. It's, we've, they've we've kind of gone stop. for either, no, you know, the, the party of leave, the party's standing for leave, Brexit, or the ones that say well, let's just got, remain we, we've got to use our time you know we've we've got a deadline of october the 31st and now that's still going to be tough clearly because the um leadership election is going to go to the end of um, july and then obviously we've got august and we've got conference season and these kind of things but we've got to use the time available to us to to talk to listen importantly and to re regain a bit of goodwill both within the the different views in parliament across the road but also between the uk and brussels to see if there's any more flex if people can just pivot just a little bit then they, we haven't got that much more to move to actually get something there across the line. There will be no room for any of that if Boris Johnson or Dominic Raab or anybody else comes in as party leader who is saying we leave on the 31st of October with or without a deal. Well, I think, look, I mean, first of all, in terms of leadership, I'm the vice chairman of the party, so I, I, I'm sitting back and remaining neutral because I'm helping uh, to organise it, if you, like, if you like, with CCHQ. But I haven't made my mind up in, in the leadership. But whatever, whatever position they take, if you've got that October 31st deadline, that should sharpen minds. It should, um, hopefully, because nobody wants to... I, I voted so to keep... Sharpen no, whose minds? Well, everybody's, frankly, because I voted to keep no deal on the table in Parliament, as did, as did a lot of um, my colleagues. Oh, yeah. Because what it does, it enables us to... Um, the EU don't want to leave without a deal. The, we, we don't but want to leave... we've been there. I mean, I'm just confused as to why another deadline is going to sharpen anyone's minds when we went through the 29th of March. Because I think the focus of, uh, of uh, the, the people that you're mentioning is that um, if we leave no deal on the table, it has to be a serious um, consideration. It has to be a serious alternative. If you're just saying that, if you're just saying, if you imagine someone sort of buying a house and, and talking to the estate agent, say, I, I don't like the price, and then the spouse is behind you holding up colour swatches against the wall, somewhat undermines your negotiating position. If you're actually seriously prepared to prepare for no deal, to work through no deal, and to tackle the turbulence that, that, that will follow, which if, is why it's not my default position, then that's something that I would hope that Brussels will actually start okay. to engage with. If the party gets a leader like Boris Johnson, is that going to then be a recipe for a general election? Because if it's a, it's a party that is going to be saying, as you're saying should be the case, we would get, take a no deal uh, Brexit, that's not going to happen in Parliament. Well, look, I think what we've got, in before we even get to those sort of considerations, we've got probably about six weeks now two or three weeks for the members of parliament and then a few weeks for the members to consider and over that period we're going to have a lot of debate which I hope is going to be a sort of reinvigorating debate rather than personality led it'll be issues led of course it will be dominated by Brexit but there's so much more to talk about in terms of the domestic issue and uh, issues and a vision for the future that will help to uh, to sort of crystallise some of the differences and where we can act, where we've got importantly the areas that we agree on in Brexit. What, what do you think about having a general election in this country? I just don't think it's something that, that we need. I don't think it's something that the Conservatives but, I mean, would like, of, Yeah, I mean, would, uh, would, would the Conservatives or Labour want one right now? No, well, that's what, what I was going to say. Night? I don't think the Labour Party would either. Um, and so, which is why, another reason why I come back to the fact that uh, this is why we actually need to work together to, for, for the sake of the country, frankly, rather than just keep boring people to the ground to vote. 
which I'm happy to do. I'm happy to do that, and I, I hope that um, that others are as well. Because what people, what I took out of um, Thursday was that people want to get on with the job. It's slightly sad that there's a lot of people today, uh, commentators and well, especially some politicians, still rehearsing the arguments of three years ago about whether we should leave. We should be talking about how we leave and respect that first referendum and actually find that common ground that we can get around to make sure we leave in as orderly way as possible. Paul Scully, thank you very much. We'll leave, we will have more political reaction from here. For now, back to Ben. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, well, let's get a look at the picture now. In the rest of Europe, pro-European parties have retained a pretty firm grip on the EU Parliament, but Eurosceptic parties have seen strong gains, especially in Italy, France, Poland, as well as here in the UK, of course. Uh, so let's go to our Europe correspondent, Gavin Lee, who's in Brussels. Uh, Gavin, what, what's your reading of these results really across Europe? Uh, give us a general picture and also the reaction there in Brussels. Well, we've got now a far more diverse, pluralistic, fragmented uh, European Parliament than there has been ever. Um, you know, since it was created in the 50s. Now, what we're looking at is when you look at parties in each of the 28 countries, to get anything through, you know, the, the MEPs, they've had 751 of them, you know, they can't work nationally, they have to work as big groupings. So they traditionally go you know, Labour with the Socialists, um, you know, Conservatives previously with what's called the EPP, the centre right. They've reformed their own group in the last few years, but they have big centre right, centre left groupings. Now, they have ebbed away those traditional groups that collectively, with the help of the Liberals, have managed to get things through, for example, the scrapping of mobile charges last year. What we're looking at now is the ebbing away of those parties. Those votes have seen a flowering of the Green Party. We've seen more votes to the Liberals and to the far-right parties too. Matteo Salvini leading that charge in Italy, and he was tweeting last night a picture of him saying, we're the number one party, his Liga party. But remember, there's lots of differences. None of those far-right, anti-migrant parties are calling for EU exits like the Brexit parties. They want change within the European Union. They want more power to national governments. The opposite from the other notable story, Emmanuel Macron in France, who wants to see change, but he's leading that pro-European charge, and he was defeated by Marine Le Pen and the Rassemblement National, the National Rally Party. So there's lots of interesting domestic spillouts, including in Greece, actually, where there's been a snap election called by Alexis Tsipras of the left Syriza party. He came second. And watch Austria, too, today, where Sebastian Kurz, the Chancellor, coming first yesterday, his People's Party, he'd kicked out members of the far-right Freedom Party. They got caught in a scandal called Ibiza Gate, where their uh, vice chancellor was seen to be giving contracts in exchange for support. Well, the Freedom Party got a kicking, but there's a vote of confidence for the chancellor today, and he may actually lose his position. So lots of domestic ripples across Europe as a result of last night. And Gavin, what do you think will be the reaction there in Brussels to the performance of the Brexit Party here in the UK and the fact they're going to have a very large number of MEPs? Yeah, the Brexit Party it looks like it will be the biggest party of any national government's party within the European uh, Parliament. You know, bigger than uh, Angela Merkel's and now Anna uh, Kramp Kauenbauer's party, the CDU, CDS, po CSU party in Germany. I spoke to a senior EU official last night within the European Council who said. For us, it will be a minor bad smell. We'll have to deal with that. We know they'll be jeering. It'll be a more powerful force with Matteo Salvini, with uh, Marine Le Pen as well. But it will be a short-term pantomime. After that, I think EU leaders believe they've gone through what you know, is their annus horribilis for f four years with the migration crisis, with the terrorist uh, attacks multiple times across Europe, with the Greek financial crisis. Now they've slimmed down the political wars. They're looking at Brexit, but they've become used to Brexit. So I think they will look to that and, and try to work out what change they want within themselves, but probably wait for anything significant to the end of the year once, and if it happens, uh, the UK leaves the EU. All right, Gavin, thank you very much indeed for your time. That's uh, Gavin Lee there for us in Brussels. So let's uh, focus a bit more on the results here in the UK, and in particular, a close focus on the West Midlands, uh, where the Brexit Party took more than a third of the votes. If we take a look at the numbers for you, you see that the Brexit Party there gained 38% of the vote. Uh, Labour came in second with 17%. That's down 10 points on the uh, 2014 election results and in a close third came the Liberal Democrats that's up on last time by 11 points then the Greens the Conservatives in fifth and UKIP on 5% of the vote that's down 27 uh, points there we are those are the West Midlands uh, 
results for you. So let's just discuss that a little bit more with uh, our correspondent Navtej Johal, who's in Wensbury near Walsall. Across the West Midlands there, just uh, paint a picture for us of uh, what these election results mean and what, what they show us. Well, you might recall, Ben, that in 2016, at the EU referendum election, there were just, uh, the West Midlands was the region with the largest proportion of Leave voters. 59.3% of the vote here went to Leave, more so than any other region in the country. And last night's results seem to reflect, again, that Brexit remains very much uh, the big story here. Although for the time being here in this cafe, Mari's Cafe in the black country, breakfast is more of an interest than Brexit. Last night, though, we learned that the Brexit party uh, earned three MEPs. Labour lost one of theirs. Conservatives had a terrible night, again losing one of theirs. And the Lib Dems and Green gained a seat each as well. So three for Brexit Party, one for Labour, one Lib Dem, one Green and one Conservative, making up the seven MEPs in across, across the West Midlands. Um, in terms of the East Midlands, you might remember as well, again, that was the second uh, largest vote for Leave, 58 or so percent there in 2016. And last night, again, Brexit Party coming out very much on top, mirroring the national result there. And a surname which might be quite familiar to most voters, uh, most viewers across the country, Rhys Mogg, becoming a, an MEP there. Not Jacob, of course, his sister Anunziata, who said last night that this result will be devastating to her brother Jacob. Uh, but also an interesting picture emerging, Conservatives who had a terrible night across the country Again, a very bad night in the West and East Midlands too, losing both of their MEPs in the East Midlands, Lib Dems gaining one and Labour retaining their one MEP. So across the board there, the West Midlands and the, and the East Midlands mirroring the national picture, seeing the Brexit party very much on top, three MEPs each. And what that means in terms of uh, a national picture, what that means in terms of um, a future either referendum or general election, of course, is very difficult to say, with the Lib Dems gaining a seat each in the West and East Midlands. But one thing is very clear, divisions remain the case here in the West Midlands and the East Midlands too, and something which a cup of tea and a fry-up just will not be able to solve. Avtesh, I think you need to get some breakfast. It's making me feel hungry just watching all those chaps having theirs. <laughs> Right, uh, let's see if Joanna Gosling's had her breakfast. She's at Westminster <laughs> getting more political reaction for us right now. I have had my breakfast and I'm joined by Alistair Campbell who is just drinking his coffee. Let me introduce my guests here. Uh, Alistair, Nikki de Costa, former Director of Legislative Affairs at Number 10 and Senior Counsel at Cicero Group and also Tony Blair's former Director of Communications, Alistair Campbell. You just finished your coffee. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, welcome. Um, well. Where do we stand today? Because obviously we've had this dramatic election. The two main parties here uh, knocked off the top spots easily. Um, but what has actually changed here at Westminster? What do you think, Alistair Campbell? Well, the arithmetic hasn't changed at all, but I think the politics has changed because you've seen both the main parties rejected comprehensively. The Conservatives largely because they haven't done the one thing they said was their priority, which is deliver Brexit. And the Labour Party because of the utter confusion over what they actually believe and what they stand for. And so I think that does change things. Um, obviously what happens now in terms of the Tory party leadership will be very, very important, but I don't think anybody can pretend that there is now some mandate for no deal. And I know Nigel Farage is grabbing an awful lot of headlines today, but actually I think deep in his heart he's not going to think this is that great. He got a third of a third. Just over one in ten people in this country came out to vote for his party when he said it was all about democracy. And I think the, the real change for me is the fact that the Lib Dems and the Greens and the SNP in Scotland and Plaid in Wales, the parties that unequivocally pro-Remain, pro-People's Vote, anti-Brexit, have done very, very well. So you obviously want there to be a second referendum. Uh, the Labour leadership have not been going for that. Jeremy Corbyn overnight did seem to indicate potentially changing position, hasn't reiterated what has previously been the mantra, which is we will honour the result of the referendum. Do you see the Labour Party now shifting? Well, the Labour Party membership shifted a long time ago. Most of the parliamentary Labour Party shifted a long time ago. Most of the shadow cabinet now appear to have shifted. You had overnight John McDonnell, Tom Watson, Emily Thornbury basically all saying, can we now please smell the coffee and wake up? 
and you've got Jeremy Corbyn, Len McCluskey, Seamus Milne, Carrie Murphy, Andrew Murray, a sort of coterie around Jeremy Corbyn, who, if they're not careful, I believe are going to drive the Labour Party to oblivion. And these people who've... I, you know, I lent my vote to the Liberal Democrats for the first time in my life. I know an awful lot of people who did the same, to, whether to the Lib Dems or to the Greens or to the SNP in Scotland, whatever it might be. And they've got to be won back. And the whole strategy for the Labour Party seems to me, well, you know, you're either in, you're out, get out. And it's just not clever, it's not sensible politics. And I think the Labour Party has got to get off a fence, stop riding two horses at once, because we know what happens if you try and put one leg on one horse, one on the other, and come out unequivocally and clearly for a position and fight for it. Nikki da Costa, um, there's a Tory leadership contest obviously underway, um, and the push now is uh, many within the party are saying what this indicates is that we need a new leader to take on Nigel Farage and it needs to be somebody like Boris. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I think the conclusion is is that I mean, and, and everyone's going to interpret, interpret the result in a different way. We've seen lots of different maths going up saying, oh, well, if you, if you shuffle Labour over here, then you've got a clear Remain vote, etc. Everyone's going to take their own interpretation. It's a lot simpler for the Conservative Party in that interpretation about where they think they can get the votes from and where they know they can't take the votes from. It's very unlikely they can take it for Change UK, Lib Dems, etc. What it means, therefore, for, I think, for any new Prime Minister is that they have to make a decision there's not going to be any uh, way forward which isn't going to have risks where they can say to their MPs, you're not going to risk a general election. You're not going to risk maybe some of your colleagues going and voting no confidence. But I'm going to set out the best strategy I can to get us through this. Uh, and in my view, we've been for the last few years trying to do the fudge. Um, that's not worked. And so any um, prime ministerial candidate that comes forward and says, uh, it'll be something, but I won't count and it's no deal, essentially they're saying it's the same strategy as before, and that's not working. So are we ultimately going to get a general election? It, because if, if you do end up with a candidate yes. that's saying no deal, we, we've been around this yeah. again and again. There are two circumstances in which we might get to a general election. The first is if uh, the a new Prime Minister puts forward a vote and says, right, we should go for a general election, you need two-thirds majority for that. It's a difficult one to win. Uh, the other circumstances is when, uh, if there are MPs, particularly on the Conservative side, that are so opposed to the position that a new Prime Minister takes that they're willing to vote down their government to trigger that 14 days, either to hand over power to Jeremy Corbyn or to say, we're going to try and maybe do another leadership changeover you know, or, or bully this new Prime Minister into a different position. So in those circumstances, I think it's very uncontrollable. Bear in mind, if you add up all the numbers for all the parties, all of Labour vote, Labour would need, in order to form a majority, they'd need eight Conservatives at a minimum, half the independents, uh, that's five, all the Lib Dems, all Plaid Cymru, all SNP. The numbers for a stable Corbyn-led government is not very clear. So when you hear somebody like Philip Hammond say, He's not certain how he would vote on a no confidence. He's actually not clear as to what the result of that would be. Um, so I think prepare for a general election is always wise to have in mind. Um, we may well get through. Alistair Campbell, would a general election be a disaster for Labour and the Tories? I think both the main parties are, are pretty scared of a general election at the moment. And I think it underlines the fact that this issue per se, Brexit, itself I don't think is going to get resolved by a general election, which is why I believe, and I believe for some time, it has to go back to a referendum. And on this democracy point, I think it's extraordinary that we're all going to be talking for the next few weeks about electing a new Prime Minister who's going to be elected by just over 100,000, mainly very elderly people, most of whom probably voted for Nigel Farage, and they are going to decide the next Prime Minister. And that somehow is democratic, but putting this whole sorry mess back to the people is not. I mean, our politics has gone, if I may say so, a bit crazy, that that is seen as democratic and a people's vote is not. If um, Jeremy Corbyn doesn't start to do what you want him to do, which is to say second referendum, will you stay in the party? Well, I don't quite know what the position is because I didn't campaign against the Labour Party. Uh, I've but you voted, you voted, voted Lib Dem in I voted for one of the pro-Remain parties and I did that frankly, because I want the Labour Party to see sense and I would like to stay in the Labour Party and whether that will happen or not, I don't know. But I think if the Labour Party goes between now and through this Tory leadership election and through the next phase and up to the next general election with this facing both ways policy of trying to pretend to leave us that they leave and to pretend to remain as that we remain, then I think that's unsupportable. And I'll tell you, there's a, people should check out a couple of things. John Howarth, who's an MEP, who thankfully just got re-elected, I think he was last on the list, 
And he sent right, an extraordinary email last night to his supporters, apologising for the National Party campaign and what he called the sabotage of people like him trying to campaign on a sensible policy. And there's another Labour figure I'd like to mention, that was Darren Rodwell, who's a council leader in Barking and Dagenham, which voted two to one to leave. And he has turned that around by campaigning relentlessly and aggressively against Brexit. And Labour last night hammered the Brexit party in Barking and Dagenham. Nikki, as politics ever been more polarised in this country and the way that things are breaking down in terms of you know, strong Labour supporters, strong Tory supporters not even voting for their, their parties in what has happened over the past few days? Being in my sort of, a, well, actually getting towards my late 30s now, um, I'm not sure I can judge about whether politics has ever been more polarised. It is certainly some of the most difficult times in Parliament. What I would say is that actually it may be helpful for the two parties, to, the two main parties, to take a more uh, definitive position. Because, for example, if Labour were to back Remain, then I think for those uh, MPs in Labour Leave seats, uh, confronting with what they're seeing in terms of the Brexit party, etc., confronting with what they're seeing in the constituents, then they may feel freer to vote in a particular way. Way. That may counterbalance what happens on the, the ultra-remainers in the Conservative Party. I suspect that over the course of the year we will see whipping break down further, right. which may facilitate a solution. So we'll end up with parties that are contained in their camps but that are free for all when it comes to voting, you think? Possibly, possibly. <laughs> well, let's see what happens. Thank you both Thank you. very much. And I will hand you back to Ben. More reaction from here later. Thanks, Joanna. See you later. Well, you're watching a uh, special BBC News coverage of the EU elections. Uh, let's just tell you then that in a major blow for the largest parties at Westminster, the Brexit Party have emerged as the clear winners in the poll for a new European Parliament. With 10 out of 12 regions declared, we can take a look for you now at the current share of the vote for the parties. And it is the Brexit Party that have gained the largest share of the vote, almost a third. That's 32%. Liberal Democrats taking second place with 20%. That's up 13 points compared to their results. In the last EU elections of 2014, Labour coming in third with 14%. That is down 11 points on last time round. The Greens, they increased their support. They gained 12% of the vote. The Conservatives fell to an historic low, fifth place in the poll. Uh, just 9% of the vote for the Conservatives. The new Change UK party pretty much failing to make uh, an impact, just 3% of the vote. Well, my colleague Rita Chakrabarty has got a closer look at the results. This has been an election of stark contrast, with the Brexit party putting in a very strong performance, but the Liberal Democrats and the Green Party also doing very well. And disaster, really, for the Labour Party and the Conservatives. Let's take a look at some of the detail. At Castle Point here in the east of England, this was one of the Brexit Party's most impressive results. Look at that, taking 59% of the share of the votes, leaving all the other parties way behind. Uh, they will be extremely pleased with uh, that result. In Windsor and Maidenhead, this is... Theresa May's constituency, the Brexit Party, took the, to the lion's share of the vote there. And in St Helens, the Brexit Party came out on top. Now, this is a Labour stronghold. They were way ahead of the Labour Party there. So that's all very representative of how strongly the Brexit Party has performed. But the Liberal Democrats will also be very pleased with their performance in these elections. Uh, they took on conservative areas like Elmbridge, for example, in the southeast. 39% of the share of the vote here. Now, this has been a solidly conservative area for the last three European elections. And if we just have a little look at the change in the share of the vote, look at that. The Conservative vote just plummeting by 31% compared to the last time this election was held. Uh, that Liberal Democrat performance uh, was... Uh, reproduced in Islington, that's Jeremy Corbyn's constituency. The, the Liberal Democrats came top there. In fact, they topped the poll in London. Um, for the Labour Party, that sort of very difficult result was reproduced in Scotland, where the SNP really took almost all the local authority areas uh, in Glasgow at Labour's expense. Labour again had a difficult time in Wales, in Blynau Gwent, the Brexit Party 
came out on top. And a word for the Greens, who had a very good election, uh, coming top in three local authority areas, including Bristol there, as you can see. But I think one of the starkest facts of this election is the performance of the Conservative Party, who got 9% of the vote, coming fifth in the league table. And the most startling fact is that of, in all the local authorities throughout the country, the Conservatives failed to come top of the poll in any single council area. As Rita Chakrabarti, uh, more reaction coming in from the Labour Party, from the Shadow Brexit Secretary uh, Keir Starmer, has just been tweeting, there it is, it's no use trying to hide from these very disappointing results. We need to reflect hard and listen to our members, supporters and voters. The only way to break the Brexit impasse is to go back to the public with a choice between a credible leave option and remain. So there we are, the continuing debate about the Labour Party's policy on another referendum. Uh, I think we've got a bit more of that uh, tweet then from Keir Starmer actually, just saying, but as we move forward on this, we must remain united and able to speak to uh, and for the country as a whole, whichever way people voted in uh, 2016. Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader, indicating there will be more talks in the coming days about uh, what exactly these European Parliament election results mean. And let's take a look at the results uh, from a European perspective. Uh, this shows not just individual parties, uh, but parties with common ground. Uh, normally, the centre-left grouping has an overall majority, not this time. Anti-EU parties, the Liberals, and the Greens have gained ground so that negotiations and horse trading may be lie ahead for control of the EU agenda. Turnout uh, was a surprise. Figures have risen to 51%. That's up from 42.6% last time round in 2014. Uh, it's the first time that's gone up and the best turnout since 1994. Right, let's get uh, the picture in Italy and our correspondent James Reynolds is uh, in Milan for us. Uh, James, just talk us through the story of the night there. The far-right populist party, The League, was the big winner here. It got around 33-34% of the vote. It's led by the Interior Minister Matteo Salvini, uh, who's an ally of Marine Le Pen and Nigel Farage. He is now the dominant politician in Italy. We're here in Milan because this is his heartland. He began this party when he took it over, uh, attempting to break away from Italy. He didn't like the rest of Italy, southern Italy. Then he changed policy and decided that he'd like to rule the rest of Italy. And uh, he campaigned uh, in this election against Brussels, against uh, Islam, against migration. And uh, a lot of voters, particularly here in the north of Italy, liked what they heard. He will be strengthened in Italy, but that's not the same thing as saying that he will now go to Brussels and change all the institutions in Brussels, because he's got to find populist partners. Uh, a few days ago in the campaign, uh, he had about 11 parties here together, populist parties from across Europe, far-right parties that he hopes he can cobble together uh, to influence life in Brussels, but it may be that they struggle to find uh, common ground in economic policy and in their policy towards Russia. He tweeted a picture of himself last night celebrating the election with a picture of Vladimir Putin behind him, but the Polish populists do not like Russia at all. So I think there will be problems for Matteo Salvini when he tries to take the power that he's won in this election from Italy, his heartland, towards Brussels. James, thank you very much indeed. James Reynolds there with the latest uh, on the Italian results from Milan. Uh, let's go back to my colleague Joanna. She's at Westminster. Thank you very much, Ben. We're going to speak now to Sebastian Payne, Whitehall correspondent at the Financial Times, and Pippa Crera, political editor of the Daily Mirror. Thank you both for joining us. The, the, the questions being asked here today, obviously, are what do these results mean for Labour and the Tories? Which direction do they go in? Uh, uh, Labour do seem to be slightly shifting. Uh, we've just heard Keir Starmer saying referendum. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn seems to have been echoing that. Let's start with Labour. Pippa, what do you think? will happen now with Labour? Well, what's clear from these elections is that any party which had anything less than an absolutely clear position mm -hmm. has suffered. And Labour, of course, for a long time has been pursuing its position of constructive ambiguity in order to unite these two wings, the sort of the, the 
majority of the MPs and members who are Remain backing and, uh, and then lots of Labour voters in the north and outside of London, um, Midlands and so on, uh, who actually backed Brexit. So it's been trying to sort of straddle this fence and try and keep this very fragile coalition together. And last night showed that the big, this is now a big fault line in the Labour Party and it's really reaching the point as we go towards October um, when our next Brexit deadline is. Obviously, it's going to be preceded by party conferences where members are going to have a say on party policy. This, it's reaching the point where it feels like Labour are going to have to move one way or the other. And as you mentioned, Keir Starmer this morning, Emily Thornbury last night, um, both uh, senior shadow cabinet ministers, obviously both very pro-second referendum, are suggesting that the party should now unequivocally, unambiguously come out in support of a second referendum and put the final say back to the people. Interestingly, John Macdonald himself, who obviously is a very powerful figure in the Labour in the Labour leadership, has also hinted that, that should be the way forward. He recognises that the party position of a general election first is looking increasingly unlikely. Not very appetising. Not going to happen. Here, so no. that they should then move on to the final stage of their policy, which is to back a second referendum. So, Seb, do you think we are heading to a situation then where we do have a party of Remain and a party of No Deal Brexit here in Westminster? Because obviously if, if Labour say that they will support a referendum, does that push them into a position where they would have to campaign for Remain? I think that's very much the case and they're still trying to hold the line, as Pippa was saying, that we would want a shiny Labour jobs first Brexit as opposed to this evil Tory Brexit. But clearly the way that Labour voters are going, the way senior shadow cabinet ministers are changing their minds, is making that unsustainable. On the Conservative side, it is clear that even though we have Nigel Farage's Brexit party, who have come first and done very well, the Conservatives are going to have to become the real Brexit party because the vote, the Remain supporting Conservative voters all seem to have gone to the Liberal Democrats. And it's clear if the Conservatives don't deliver Brexit, deal or no deal, by the end of October, then they are going to be wiped out. Now, we should all is of course remember that these elections are not a general election, they're not an opinion poll, they are always a protest vote. That is how European elections have been seen and lots of voters have used it to say I'm fed up with Brexit, I want to stop it. And others say I'm fed up with not having Brexit, I want to get on with it. But what it does suggest is if we end up spilling into a general election this year, which I think is overwhelmingly more likely than not, then those parties are going to have to rapidly clarify their Brexit position. So for Labour, that means they're going to have to become the party of Remain and if it's for the Tories, they're going to have to become the party of Brexit. And as you said, that could well mean a no-deal Brexit if that deal with the EU is dead as it seems. Can you, do you think a, a general election is now inevitable? I don't think it's inevitable. I think we've learned that you shouldn't uh, be foolish to make <laughs> certain, here, certain yeah. political predictions. But I definitely think we're now at a point where it seems more likely than not. I mean, look at it this way. As Seb says, any, whoever the next Prime Minister is, the Tory uh, Prime Minister, is going to have to try and keep the Brexit wing of the party happy if they're going to try and unite the party. And that means at least sounding as though they're prepared to keep a no-deal Brexit on the table. Their idea, obviously, people like Boris Johnson, and Dominic Raab is to go back to the European Union and negotiate on those terms. They claim that they want to keep no, dex, no deal Brexit on the table. Whether it actually happens as you get closer to it and they realise the ramifications and the huge political e economic cost of that is another thing. But if it became government policy that that was what they were going to go for, then not only the Labour Party and all the other parties in the House of Commons, barring possibly the DUP, but also uh, probably a, you know, a, fairly, a fairly large handful um, of Conservative MPs would not support that in the Commons. Now, what it comes down to is if there was a no confidence vote in the government, would they be prepared to vote against their own party in order to bring down that government and to stop that no deal Brexit? People like Philip Hammond over the weekend were suggesting that he might be. So others say that's just talk, it's just threatening. Maybe it is, but it's actually something that the next Conservative leader really needs to take, in, take into account. Are they going to have the numbers to take Britain out of the, out of the EU without a deal? Currently, there's not a majority for that in Parliament. Um, how, when will things shake down, Seb? I mean, when do you think we'll get clarity from Labour? When will we um, get clarity on whether the, the Tory party is going to sort of find it irresistible that the country in the, the sort of party at large in the country, there's a desire for, for Boris Johnson, but 
what he's pushing for isn't necessarily yeah. uh, chiming with what, what the MPs there want. Well, for Labour, I think the hard deadline is their conference coming up in September, which is very clear that if Brexit hasn't been resolved by then or if the leadership hasn't changed its position, then they will be mandated by Labour's very pro-Remain membership to back a second referendum. And I think Jeremy Corbyn and his office are very aware of that and they've been trying to sit on this fence for a long time, speaking to their Remain voters in cities and their sort of more Leave voters in uh, provincial parts of the country, and that fence has been taken away by these elections. So that is the hard deadline for them to come to a position. For the Conservatives, it's all going to be worked out over the next two months with this leadership contest. And I think there is a danger it becomes a Eurosceptic arms race, as one senior MP said it to me, with each MP and each candidate trying to out Brexit the other and say increasingly more no deal things, aggressive things. Um, but Boris Johnson, as you said, and, you know, we always talk about him as the kind of front runner here, but he has set the tone of this race by these comments saying we will leave deal or no deal on the 31st of October. And as you were saying earlier, Pip, there's a very good question of whether that is Boris saying we will leave without a deal or whether it's Boris really just continuing Theresa May's position of trying to get a deal through while keeping no deal on the table because keeping his party together and the parliamentary arithmetic on no deal is very, very difficult. Thank you both very much indeed. Back to you, Ben. Thank you, Joanna. See you a little bit later on. Well, we're going to hear from our correspondents in Scotland and Northern Ireland, where counting continues. Uh, but let's just have a quick look and a closer look at the results in Wales for you, first of all. The Brexit Party won the largest share of the vote there, with almost a third, 32%. Plaid Cymru uh, gained second place with 20% of the vote. Labour came in third, 15%. Uh, Liberal Democrats closely behind with 14%. The Conservatives in fifth place followed by the Greens. And when we look at the change in the share of the vote since the last election, which was uh, in 2014, you can see uh, the big gains for the Brexit party in comparison with the losses for the Labour party, which lost 13 percentage points in Wales. Conservatives also down compared to last time. UKIP also performing badly, down 24 points. So when translated into MEPs in Wales, the Brexit party have two, Plaid Cymru and Labour both have one. And you can see there that the Conservatives and UKIP uh, each lost an MEP. Uh, right, let's get the latest on all of that from our Wales correspondent Arwen Jones, who's in Cardiff. And yeah, as we were showing there, Arwen, a miserable night for Labour in Wales. Yes, no hiding from that. And, and what you're looking at, the context here, is just how dominant Labour has been in Wales for the past century or so. When you consider in, the, in 38 to the last 39 Wales-wide elections, it's always been Labour uh, that has topped the poll here. So in third place, a very disappointing evening for them. And that's why, really, Plaid Cymru are, are talking up the, the significance of this result so much, saying that the tectonic plates in Welsh politics have shifted. Now, I guess we'll have to wait to see on that one, because in two years' time there will be... Uh, elections to the Welsh Assembly just behind me there. Will voters, having dabbled with Plaid Cymru in this election, decide once again to back them in that election or will they return uh, to Labour? And I guess that will depend in part over La uh, Labour's uh, strategy on Brexit. You have to bear in mind that here in Wales, Labour is a party of government. There is a Labour First Minister in that Senate building behind me, Mark Drakeford, who has stayed very close to Jeremy Corbyn's view on how Brexit should be uh, handled by the party today a lot of pressure on him to distance himself from Jeremy Corbyn's position there's a Brexit minister here in Wales Jeremy Miles who says we need to rethink our position so some very serious conversations will be had uh, within the Labour Party trying to perhaps distance itself uh, from its UK counterpart okay Owen thank you and to Scotland and our Scotland correspondent Lorna Gordon who's in Glasgow and Lorna the SNP on track for their best ever European election results yeah, we're expecting the Western Isles result in the next half hour or so, the Scotland-wide result in uh, about midday, but that's unlikely to change the results as they currently stand. Uh, best ever result for the SNP, their clear unequivocal message that Scotland's for Europe seems to have hit home. They look set to increase their number of MEPs to three. Uh, they really did have uh, a resounding success in some areas like Dundee. They were more than 30 points ahead of their clearest rivals. Of course, there is a big chunk of people here in Scotland 
Scotland, though, who did vote to leave the European Union. The Brexit party seems to have swept up that vote. They, they look on track to have one MEP. Conservatives, a pretty poor night for them. They do have one MEP, and I suppose they will take some consolation from the fact that their share of the vote here is bigger than elsewhere in the UK. The big losers, though, are Labour. Dismal night for them here in Scotland. They finished fifth, lost both of their seats. Labour the loser, the SNP the resounding winner here in Scotland. Lorna, thank you. That's the picture there for us uh, from Glasgow. We can join our Ireland correspondent Emma Vardy now, who's at a count in uh, Northern Ireland, in Macrafelt. Emma, it's all very busy there. They're counting away, are they? They are, and they only just started counting at 8 o'clock this morning because here in Northern Ireland, the Christian tradition of observing Sunday uh, as a day of rest means there is no counting of votes on Sunday. So much earlier on in the process here. And don't forget, of course, Northern Ireland uses a slightly different voting system to the rest of the UK, the single transferable vote system, whereby uh, voters or will rank candidates in order of preference. That also means uh, that counting takes a little longer here. But the big story, of course, is that for the last 40 years, the last eight European elections in Northern Ireland. European elections have always delivered two unionist candidates and one nationalist candidate here. So perhaps they've been perhaps rather dull affairs, you might say, uh, for the last 40 years. But this year, everything is pretty different. Brexit has thrown all that up in the air. We're expecting one unionist, one nationalist candidate to be elected. But the battle for the third seat is where it's going to get really interesting. All right, Emma, thank you very much. Emma Vardy there for us in Macrafelt. Uh, let's talk now to our reality check correspondent, Chris Morris, who's here to analyse a bit more about um, what the Brexit party actually stand for, because they've done very well indeed. They didn't actually have a manifesto. What, what is their version of Brexit? Yeah, I mean, we know they want to leave the European Union, but you're right, no manifesto and very little detail on their website about what their policy would be. This is what Nigel Farage has been talking about during this campaign, a clean break Brexit. It's interesting that he doesn't tend to use the term no deal Brexit. Maybe he thinks it sounds a bit more scary. His party says it's misleading, but there's no doubt what clean break Brexit would mean. It would mean that the laws which have governed our relationship with Europe, whether on trade or security, for more than 40 years would disappear overnight. So for some, clean break. For others, pretty sudden rupture. Another thing that this clean break would mean, it's something that Mr Farage has said a lot, is that the divorce bill that the government has agreed with the EU to pay £39 billion over a number of years, he says that money would not be paid. It's a nice sort of popular election slogan, but of course not paying that money would hardly improve relations with the European Union in the time after Brexit when you need to start talking to them again. But of course the main thing that the Brexit party says is we should leave the EU on World Trade Organization terms. And just tell us a bit more about what that would mean, because all of this is going to come into closer focus with, with the demise of Theresa May. People are saying that the possibilities of a no-deal Brexit are actually on the rise. Yeah, and th this is... You know, get used to this, this phrase, because you're going to hear it a lot in the Conservative leadership campaign as well. WTO terms. What does it mean? Well, not a lot, to be honest, because World Trade Organization rules are, are the baseline of international trade, the basic building blocks, if you like, and then countries tend to put other things on top of them when they have free trade agreements and so forth. Uh, now, the Brexit party says, don't worry, we can use something called Article 24 to ensure that we can still have trade with the EU uh, without tariffs or taxes when goods cross borders. The trouble with Article 24 is that it, you can only use it as if both sides agree. And if you're leaving with no deal, well, there isn't a deal there. There's no agreement to implement Article 24 with. And look at the priorities of the EU. If there was no deal, and then they say, well, we need to talk to you after Brexit about something, Mr Farage and many Conservatives say, we want to talk about a free trade deal. The EU's made very clear these would be its initial priorities. They look rather familiar, don't they? Yeah. The divorce bill, the Irish border and citizens' rights, precisely the issues that are at the heart of the withdrawal agreement that Theresa May has negotiated and which has been rejected three times in the House of Commons. So these issues are not going to go away. Uh, and while the Brexit Party's done well, if you like, with its simple slogans, promoting simple solutions, but what we've found about Brexit in the last couple of years is the problems it creates are very complex. Chris, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Chris Morris there from our Reality Check team. Uh, let's get a look at the latest weather forecast for you. Simon King's got that. 
Thank you, Ben. We've seen quite a few uh, showers so far this morning, particularly across Northern Ireland, through North West England and across Wales. Those showers would become a bit more widespread as we go through the afternoon and some of them could be heavy, perhaps even thundery as they push their way into the Midlands, eastern and through southern areas of England. More persistent rain in northeastern uh, England, southeastern Scotland. Sunny spells towards the north of that, but with a northerly wind across northern areas, it's going to feel quite chilly actually throughout this afternoon. Temperatures getting to about 9 to 13 degrees. Meanwhile, in the south, with a westerly wind, those temperatures are about 17 to 19 degrees. Through tonight, we'll continue with quite a few showers right across the UK, really, as we go into Tuesday morning. Those temperatures getting down to about 6 to 10 Celsius. And then throughout Tuesday, showers again, mainly actually across eastern parts of Scotland, eastern England throughout the afternoon. Further west, you'll see something drier and sunnier than compared to today, but it's going to feel quite cool again for many of us. Bye-bye. You're watching a BBC News EU election special with the Brexit party, a clear winner in the poll, the Liberal Democrats taking second place and a very tough night indeed for the Conservatives and the Labour Party. The Brexit Party, formed only six weeks ago, are the big winners, gaining almost a third of the vote and 28 MEPs. We have got a mandate now and we want the government to include us in their negotiating team. We have got to get ready for leaving the European Union on October the 31st. There's an awful lot we can do. The Liberal Democrats who campaigned to stop Brexit come second with around 20% of the vote. And the Green Party make significant gains, posting their best performance for 30 years. I'm Joanna Gosling at Westminster, where the two main parties have suffered heavy losses. Labour fall to third place overall, with less than 15% of the vote, prompting pressure on Jeremy Corbyn's approach to Brexit. We went into an election where the most important issue was what was, our, what was our view on leaving the European Union and we were not clear about it. We were not clear on the one single thing that people wanted to hear. The Conservatives are pushed into fifth place with an historic low of less than 10% of the vote. The Home Secretary says the results are hugely disappointing and another minister says it's time to rethink their strategy. It's a wake-up call to my colleagues in Parliament that we have to deliver on the instruction the British people gave us in 2016 in the Brexit referendum. In Scotland, the SNP have dominated the poll, winning 38% of the vote. We're expecting the final declaration shortly. And in Wales, Labour are pushed into third place behind the Brexit party and Plaid Cymru. And we'll bring you all the results and the picture across Europe, where turnout is up and the traditional parties have lost out to smaller ones. Hello, good morning. Welcome to this BBC News EU election special. Well, in a major blow for the largest parties at Westminster, the Brexit Party have emerged as the clear winner in the poll for a new European Parliament. Formed little more than six weeks ago, Nigel Farage's party have won 28 seats so far and received almost a third of the share of the vote. Both Labour and the Tories posted some of their worst results ever, while the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, who both oppose Brexit, have both increased their vote and seats. Reactions coming in, the Home Secretary, Sajid Savid Chavid, said that the results were hugely disappointing and a verdict on Brexit. With 10 out of 12 regions declared, let's take a look uh, for you at the results in a little more detail. And it is the Brexit party that have gained the largest share of the vote. Uh, almost a third, there you are, 32%. The Liberal Democrats took second place with 20%, that's up 13 points compared to their result in the last EU elections in 2014. Labour 
came third with 14%. That's down 11 points on last time round. The Greens increased their support, gaining 12%. The Conservatives fell to an historic low with just 9% of the vote, putting them in fifth place. Now, although we're waiting for the final results in Scotland, the SNP have polled strongly, while the UK Independence Party's vote fell heavily to just 3%. The New Change UK party also failed to make much of an impact with only 3% share. Well, 73 seats in the European Parliament uh, were up for grabs, with the Brexit party so far winning, as we've said, 28. The Liberal Democrats have won 15 seats. They gained uh, just one in 2014, by the way. Labour have 10 MEPs altogether. That means uh, a loss of eight. The Greens more than doubled their seats. With seven MEPs, that's up four. And the impact on the Conservative Party, very clear for you there, they have got just three MEPs. That is down 15. Plaid Cymru have won one seat after beating Labour in Wales. Well, the final results in Scotland will be declared a little later on this morning and counting in Northern Ireland has started in the last hour or so. Our first report now comes from our political correspondent, Tom Barton, a warning that uh, his report does contain some flash photography. If one party was expected to capitalise on a stalemate in the Brexit process, it was the Brexit party. And they were the clear winners of the night, taking almost a third of the vote and 26 MEPs. The party's leader saying that this could be just the start. Our primary goal is to get this country to be independent and self-governing. If that doesn't happen, and if we don't leave on the 31st of October, then what you will see is the Brexit party stunning everybody at the next general election. It wasn't just a good night for the Brexit party. At the other end of the spectrum, those standing on a clear Remain platform, including the Lib Dems and the Greens, also made great leaps forward. It's the first time in 100 years that we've beaten both the Conservative and the Labour Party in the same election. And we are clearly able to demonstrate that both the Conservative and Labour Party did badly because they were absolutely split, couldn't articulate what they wanted on Brexit. We've been very clear we are the strongest Remain party. The one thing that is clear from this result is that voters don't like the tightrope walk Brexit compromises that the two main parties have been offering up to now. What then does that mean for the future? Well, both for Labour and the Conservatives, it means that they're going to be under pressure to adopt simpler, clearer positions. For the Tories, devastation at the polls is likely to see leadership candidates taking even tougher positions. This is um, the worst result in our party's history in uh, uh, elections. Um, and it's a wake-up call to my colleagues in Parliament that we have to deliver on the instruction the British paper people gave us in 2016 in the Brexit referendum. For the Labour leadership, the pressure is in the opposite direction, to back another referendum. We're now going to find ourselves in a position where we will have a Tory leadership who will insist on either a bad deal or no deal at all. And I fear it will be no deal. And in those circumstances, we must be equally clear. And it will be a disaster for our country to have no deal. There should be a referendum and we should campaign to remain. So the votes have been counted. The results far from clear cut. The country is still divided. Any end to the Brexit debate a long way off. Tom Barton, BBC News, Westminster. OK, let's uh, take you to Westminster now for reaction to the results uh, so far. And of course, at Westminster, the two biggest parties have had a very difficult night. Lots of uh, soul searching, lots of questions for the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. Joanna Gosling is there at Westminster for us with the latest. Joanna. Thank you very much, Ben. Yes, lots of soul searching going on. And so far, we've not actually seen uh, the leaders of either of the Tories or Labour on camera. We did have a statement overnight from Jeremy Corbyn in which uh, he was indicating that a second referendum might now be the way ahead for his party. Let's hear what he's been saying because he has now been speaking on camera so we can listen to what he said. 
Mr Corbyn, Tom Watson says you urgently need to rethink your Brexit policy and back a second referendum. We're consulting all our members and all our affiliates and listening to the views of MPs and members of the Shadow Cabinet after last night's election result. The country is very divided and the country has to come together. Nigel Farage and the Brexit Party are only offering a no-deal exit from the European Union with all the problems and chaos that will cause for jobs. There has to be an agreement with the European Union and there then has to be a public vote. Will you have a clear policy to back a second referendum? We had a very clear policy all along that we will call for a general election and a referendum to decide on the future. Would you support an internal party ballot on the direction of Brexit? What we'll do is consult members and through the constituency parties and affiliated trade unions and bring the issue back to conference in September. Don't you have an obligation now to listen to this result and listen to, to, to the impact in your heartlands and actually have a second referendum and a clear position to back Remain? We're listening very carefully to what everyone has to say on, on this subject. The country is clearly very divided. Farage and the Brexit Party don't offer any agreement with the EU, merely a crashing out, which will cause chaos for jobs and services across this country. I think we do have a responsibility to listen to what everyone has to say and ensure that there is a, an agreement made and that is then put to a public vote. Would you concede that your slightly ambiguous position over Brexit has meant, as some have said, that you're essentially riding two horses and you've fallen flat on your face? Not at all. What we've tried to do is bring people together. Whether they voted leave or remain, they still face problems of a Tory government in disintegration, austerity and poverty across this country. What we've done is try to bring people together and point out that in the future there has to be a trade relationship with the European Union, otherwise many jobs are at risk. Farage wants to privatise the NHS and have a no-deal exit from the European Union. I'm not quite sure how that helps people's problems. These are not good results for the Labour Party, um, and people are saying because there hasn't been clarity, you've lost votes to the Brexit Party and obviously the De Liberal Democrats. Is there an answer to that today? The answer is we listen to our members, we listen to our supporters, we listen to the public. The answer is also we take the fight to the Tories, to end austerity in this country, to rebuild our health service and our social services, to invest in good quality jobs for the future. That has to be the right way forward. The country needs to come together to face our problems together. Emily Thornbury last night suggested a further, that further compromise talks are over and that your party needed to commit, firmly commit, to a second referendum and campaign for Remain. Do we have that today from you? What you have from me today is a commitment that our party is listening to its members and its supporters and reaching out to other parties across the House of Commons to prevent a crashing out from the European Union with no deal. A commitment that the future will of course be put to a public vote as we have already proposed in Parliament and indeed colleagues including Emily voted alongside me in backing that request. Just finally, John McDonnell um, this morning has talked about the fact there needs to be a public vote. Can you clarify what he means by that? Is that a general election or is that actually a referendum? The priority at the moment, I think, is for this government to call for a general election and actually have a general election so we can decide the future. It has no majority in Parliament, it has no legislative programme, and Parliament has basically been given nothing to do by the government. I think that is a demand that should be made and made as strongly as possible. John has also pointed out, and I support this, that any final deal has to be put to a public vote, and that we're prepared to do, and indeed support it. But from here on in, the dividing line is quite clear. If people want to know what, what you stand for, can I get from you today that you would stand to be a party that support Remain and support a second referendum? What this party does is supports an agreement with the European Union to prevent crashing out, supports putting that proposal, when agreed, to a public vote. Thank you. Jeremy Corbyn with uh, his first comments on camera following the result of those, uh, those election results overnight which uh, have pushed the uh, Labour Party and the Conservatives into third and fourth place respectively in the European elections. Let's get more reaction from our assistant political editor Norman Smith. Um, so Norman, Jeremy Corbyn didn't sound there like the Labour Party policy is, is changing much. It remains the we're listening, we want to try to keep everybody on board, we don't want to leave with no deal. 
obviously those election results indicate that the current party policies didn't get the Labour Party or the Tories uh, a great deal of support in these elections. So do they need to be more definitive than this now? Um, I think what we heard was frankly just a holding position in the aftermath of catastrophically bad results. But, you know, surely the conclusion from last night's result is the current Labour strategy of constructive ambiguity has ended in failure. Um, they've tested it to destruction. It was already falling apart at the local elections. It has completely fallen apart um, in the European elections. You're looking at a party, you know, down at 14 percent as the main party of opposition after nine years uh, of Conservative-led government. I mean, that is, you know, dreadful for a party that wants to be on the cusp of power. Um, and there is no huge pressure for a rethink. And we've seen that this morning, you know, straight out of the traps. We've heard prominent figures like John McDonnell, uh, Keir Starmer, Diane Abbott, Tom Watson, Emily Thornberry, in terms saying we need a public vote. And although they're sort of caveating by saying that public vote could be a general election, in the real world, no Tory prime minister is going to consider a general election, given what happened last night. So the only public vote realistically that might be a possible policy option is to push for a second referendum. And if you think of the likely trajectory, it seems to me based on last night, whoever takes over from Mrs May is going to be pushed incrementally towards backing no deal. Therefore, what is the Labour position going to be? Are they still going to be in the middle of the road saying, can we try and have a Labour Brexit? That moment, it seems to me, has gone. And what was interesting from what Mr Corbyn said is he did not talk about a Labour Brexit. He's no longer talking about delivering on the referendum. What he's talking about is listening to the people and listening to his party. Well, if you look at the calendar, October the 31st is the next deadline. What happens before then? Well, the month before then, end of September, we have the Labour Party conference. It seems to me inconceivable that there will not be huge, huge pressure on Mr Corbyn if he has not moved well before then to embrace the idea of another referendum. And I, I, even though there are people in the party who are desperate for him not to do it, I think now the balance of forces are probably now becoming overwhelming. I mean, all of that obviously is a debate that has to happen and none of it is going to be able to happen quickly. But there is, as you say, that immovable deadline of the 30, or mm. seemingly immovable, they've moved before, but 31st of October is looking like a deadline that would be very difficult to change um, within Europe. So does it look, are we getting closer actually again to, to the prospect of a no-deal Brexit? Well, I think we're certainly getting closer to um, a no deal Brexit because, you know, what we've learned from Mrs May's, you know, failed attempt to get a deal through, failed attempt to reach some sort of agreement uh, with Labour, what we've learned from the plight of the two centre parties trying to carve out some sort of middle ground is that referendums tend to be very, very divisive and people get pushed to the extremes, if you like. And we are now, I think, pretty much back where we were in 2016, which bluntly is you're either a lever or a remainer. And the attempts to try and find some centre ground have collapsed. And so therefore, you know, for the Tories and Labour, they have to reflect, can they really try and resurrect a compromise in what, just a few months left until the next deadline? And I would suggest it's close to a doomed uh, exercise, not least of which is within the EU. There's, there's, you know, they've pretty much said what they're prepared to offer. Um, it seems to me extremely unlikely they're going to budge on it. Even if they were prepared to budge on it, there's no time to budge on it. So I think the timetable, I think the sort of political momentum is now all leading us almost, almost back to a rerun of where we were in 2016. And what is absolutely clear is how divided Labour and the Tories are in themselves. Um, there's mm. obviously been talk, you know, for a long time of a, of a realignment of domestic politics here. There was Change UK, which you got, what, half a million votes overnight, but no seats um, at all. Do you, do you, can you see the, the Tories and the Labour Party surviving as they are? Uh, well, the, the sort of the electoral system hugely helps them, let's be honest. Mm. Um, it, it does kind of lock us into a two-party system. But, I, you know, you can see situations where Tory Remainers, frankly, feel they have to support the opposition parties rather than countenance the idea of no deal. And we had the Chancellor 
I mean, basically, you know, the number two in government saying yesterday in terms, although he's never voted against the Tory party, if it came to it, well, yes, he would think about it. And I'm sure there are plenty of other uh, Tory MPs who would think final analysis, country before party, and they would do what they had to do to stop no deal. And, and, and that is because Brexit is one of those issues which in some ways is, is bigger than party. It's, you know, about identity. It's about our history. It's about what sort of country we are. It's an absolutely massive issue which trumpets the normal party loyalties. Whether that will actually split asunder our two-party system in the sort of longer term, I don't know. But in the short term, it's quite easy to see votes going all over the place. Norman, thank you very much. Well, of course, those um, election results uh, deliver proportional representation, so the, the, the results may have been fragmented. It's delivered uh, seats for all the different parties, and we've ended up with the shakedown that we've seen, which is the Brexit party well out in front in, front in terms of the number of seats. Uh, and the Liberal Democrats doing very well coming in second place. The Liberal Democrats, which here in Westminster would have been uh, written off just prior to this, but they've had their renaissance overnight and uh, really it's leaving uh, Labour and the Tories licking their wounds and wondering wh where they, how they move forward from this. Let's focus right now on Scotland. The final results have yet to be announced there. We're expecting that soon and we will bring you live coverage. But it is already clear that the SNP have done very well with three out of six MEPs. And with me now is the SNP's leader at Westminster, Ian Blackford. Welcome. Thank you for joining Good us. Morning, we, we, thank you. It's not expected that the last result that's coming in is going to no, it's not going to change picture. it. We know that uh, we've got about 38 percent of the vote, so it's the the best result for any party in the whole of the United Kingdom. And of course, we've won three out of six of seats in Scotland, our best ever result. We're pretty delighted. I think, in particular, when you consider that we've been in government now in Scotland for 12 years, and one of the things that we said to the people of Scotland: vote for us to stop Brexit because we know that it's going to be damaging to our economic interests, it's going to be damaging to jobs. I've just been listening to what Norman Smith has been saying about the Labour Party and I think there is a key difference because we've given leadership to that Remain vote in Scotland and championed the benefits that we have from what, our membership of the European Union. But when you look at the political reality of, of where we are and the voice that you've been putting out there, as you say, that is Remain, the votes yeah. that have come in in these elections for Remain, the reality is it looks like we're actually more likely heading for a no-deal Brexit on the 31st of October because that is an even harder deadline than the one we were facing before. An extension yeah. is, is even less likely. No, absolutely. And I'm not going to hide for one minute that I'm worried about the possibility of that because we're now going into an internal Tory leadership battle. They're almost trying to out-Brexit each other and it does seem that the default position in the Tory party at least is becoming a no-deal Brexit. And of course, the statute, the, 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 the Act of Parliament is already there, so unless we can change the law, it means as things stand that we'll be leaving the European Union at the end of October. And I think we've got a responsibility of working with others to extend that hand of friendship, as Norman talked about, to some of the Tory Remainers, to stop that happening. Because I think it is very clear when you look at the UK government's own economic analysis, the analysis published by the Treasury last November, a no deal would be catastrophic for our economy, it would be an act of But without going enormous... back over those arguments, which, if you don't mind, obviously, no, no, I'm not trying again to do that. Yeah, yeah. So just looking at the arithmetic of of where we are, the only way to shift the arithmetic is a general election. Yeah. And obviously, the the voting system is very different in a domestic general election here versus the proportional representation that we've had there in Europe. But um, it's conceivable, isn't it, that we could get a a parliament that reflects uh, an appetite for no deal? Uh, well, we'll see. I mean, in many respects, I think the landscape in the rest of the UK and Scotland is very, very different. We've obviously done very well in Scotland overnight. All the polls are suggesting that we would strengthen our position if there was a general election in Scotland. I would welcome that. But we're having very different discussions in Scotland and we're really saying to people there, look, Westminster's not functioning. There is no working government here our interests will not be served by being out with the European Union and we're asking the people of Scotland to reflect on the choices that they want to make as to whether or not Scotland should become an independent country and that's certainly the debate that we'll be having with people in Scotland over the course of the next few months. It's an argument that we'll bring forward 
if there is to be a general election. So would you be pushing now for a, a second independence referendum? The First Minister has said that um, we have that mandate from the people of Scotland from the 2016 election. We won that election in Scotland. We had a manifesto commitment on a material change of circumstances that we reserve that right. But when's to have it that. time to, to pull the trigger well, on it? Well, we, what we're now doing is we're bringing forward legislation in the Scottish Parliament, so that's going to be happening over the course of the coming weeks and months. Of course, we need Westminster to give its agreement to that under a so-called Section 30 process and simply say to Westminster, respect democracy, respect the sovereignty of the people of Scotland. Um, we are in when, a would you, when would you anticipate putting that point to Westminster and saying, right, now we're in a position, we want there to be a, a, a second referendum, we, uh, we want your we What want we're going to do now. is we're going to put the legislation through the Scottish Parliament that would enact that. We'll also have a conversation with the people of Scotland in a constructive manner as to what kind of country Scotland should be, the vision, that the values. We, we want to learn the lessons of everything that's happened with Brexit, for that to be a respectful debate, but really how do we create the circumstances of economic growth, how do we deliver a fairer Scotland. One of the aspects which is so important for us... Because we're almost us, out of time, yeah, but, but I mean, very, very briefly, would you anticipate briefly. a second independence referendum even the end of this year or next year? Within the lifetime of the Scottish Parliament, and the next Scottish parliamentary election is uh, May 2021, so we want to have it before we go into the next round of Scottish Parliament elections. Thank you very much, Ian Blackford. Thank you. And I'll hand you back to Ben. Thanks, Joanna. See you a little bit later on. So let's take a look now then at the overall results across the rest of Europe and the spread of seats in the European Parliament. So the big centre-right and centre-left blocs have uh, really lost their combined majority amid an increase in support for Liberals, the Greens and Nationalists. Uh, Pro-EU parties are still expected to be in a majority in the European Parliament, but the traditional blocs will need to seek new alliances. The Liberals and the Greens had a good night, while Nationalists were victorious in Italy, France and here in the UK, of course. Uh, however, the centre-right European People's Party does remain the largest bloc, and analysts say it is likely to form a grand coalition with the Socialists and Democrats bloc, uh, with support from the Liberals and the Greens. So negotiations and horse trading lie ahead in the European Parliament. Uh, the turnout in these elections was a bit of a surprise. Figures have risen to 51%. That is up uh, from 42.6% last time round in 2014. Uh, the turnout bucked a long trend of decline in voter numbers and was actually the best since 1994. Well, let's get the latest from a European-wide perspective on these elections from our correspondent Gavin Lee in Brussels. Let's start off talking about that turnout, actually, because whatever else you want to say about these elections, they've been good for democracy. More voters across Europe are turning out to vote. Yeah, more than 200 million people across Europe voting. And if you think back in 1979, where there were at 60% uh, of voters going to the polling stations, that's dropped every single time there's been European elections up until this first year bucking the trend, back around 50%, the highest it's been since 1999. I think there's a few things suddenly to just try to extrapolate why people suddenly vote. The Europe has been on the agenda, front of people's pa uh, papers, whether you love it, hate it, or somewhere in between, whether it's Brexit, the migration crisis, the Greek crisis, all of these things suddenly, you know, it's been political rope-a-dope for the European Union for the past few years with you know, terrorist attacks across Europe added to that. It's been calmer for the past two years since the migration um, crisis, you know, ebbed in terms of the numbers coming, but actually Brexit's been the main thing on the agenda. And if you look, I was talking to a senior EU Council official last night who was saying that, you know, you can only fight so many political wars and all of these things go going on actually now really there's only Brexit to deal with and we have to see for the EU point of view and the pro-EU stance what is almost a passing tide of, of the Brexiteers the Brexit party being that highest party single party of any national country now EU um, f fans and those with, within the Council Commission hope that passes by the end of October. So just paint a, a picture for us if you can Gavin of what these elections mean for the European Parliament going forward and the implications of that makeup for the European Union as a whole. 
Yeah, a lot more deliberation because the parliament is a lot more pluralistic, a lot more diverse, uh, fragmented, some people say as well. You've got the two traditional parties, the two traditional centre-right blocs. If you think of government by government and, and country by country and all of the parties, to have more power, to have more sway and get something done, you have to work within those 751 MEPs by majority. So scrapping the European mobile roaming charges, for example, um, you know, that was worked because parties form groups. You have the centre-right, EPP, the centre-left, Socialist Party. What we've seen is though two, two traditional parties have ebbed away, as you mentioned before, Ben, filling the place. Actually, the Liberals have been the single highest change in terms of the number, extra 39 seats for them. And you know, you've got the uh, Macron's party coming second in, in France, uh, En Marche, who will form part of that new Liberal coalition. Plus, you have the flowering of the Green Party as well. That's you know, the second highest rise. And then you have the nationalist far right, another big rise, not as some, including the, you know, the figurehead at the moment, Matteo Salvini in Italy, where it was the biggest party. Some losses, for example, in Sweden didn't make much of an impact in um, Spain either. But in France, in Italy, um, you know, that's where I think they'll be pushing. There'll be rabble rousers, at least. It will be a, a very rowdy European Parliament for the next few months. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, that's Gavin Lee for us there in Brussels. And back to Joanna at Westminster. Thank you very much indeed, Ben. Well, big success for the Liberal Democrats. They came second and topped the poll in London. With me now is the Lib Dem MP, Tom Brake. Thank you. Well, um, in this place, the Lib Dems were pretty much written off, and this is a, a dramatic resurgence, isn't it? It is, and uh, comes on the, on the back of some very good council election results as well. So a fantastic uh, day for us. Uh, for instance, topping the poll in London, getting three out of eight uh, MEPs elected in London. Brilliant news for Lib Dems today. Elected into um, a parliament, though, that who knows how long they're going to sit in, because obviously we're coming up against a deadline, which would mean that that becomes an irrelevance. So in terms of the Lib Dems being relevant here in Westminster, has anything changed really? Well, in reality, it's true that the European elections, in terms of the numbers of MPs in House Commons, hasn't, hasn't changed anything. But, but I think what is clear is that this was, that the vote that's just taken place was no ringing endorsement, for instance, of no deal. Uh, and therefore, I think it will uh, renew uh, the vigour of members of parliament, like the Liberal Democrats and other in other political parties, who are going to do everything they can to block No Deal, mm -hmm. but also to secure a people's vote, which I think, for any future Conservative Prime Minister, is the only way out of this almighty mess that they have created. It comes back, though, again, doesn't it, to that 31st of October deadline, and is there actually anything like the time frame that would be needed to, to have a, a second referendum and to continue with these debates. We're heading for no deal Brexit on the 31st of October. Well, there is still just time. We reckon a, a referendum could be delivered in 20 weeks. But even if that is not the case, then the European Union have indicated that as long as the UK is engaged in a democratic process with a clear outcome, which would be the case with a referendum where people are choosing between the deal at the moment, it's, the, it's only Theresa May's deal, there isn't any other on offer, or staying in the European Union. If the EU ha know that we're engaged in that process, I'm absolutely confident that they'd give us an extension to enable that uh, people's vote to take place sometime after the 31st of October. It would be risky though, wouldn't it? Because it could end up with just as unclear a picture and then we've extended and then where are we? Well, it is uh, risky in that there's no guarantee that the outcome of that uh, referendum, for instance, would support the position that I want, which is voting to stay in the European Union. However, I think that is a perfectly legitimate democratic exercise because now, three years after the Brexit vote, some clarity is emerging over what Brexit means. And that's why I think it should be put to, to, to that test. And do you support no deal Brexit being on the ballot paper in a referendum? Well, we've always said that no deal, uh, a, a no deal will be a catastrophe for the United Kingdom. The government's own analysis confirmed that. Businesses but confirmed that. But should it that. be on the referendum, on the paper? Well, I think that the, the deal that has been agreed is what should be on, on, on the ballot paper. And that's the position that, that we're, we're fighting for at present. Having no deal on the ballot paper with all of the economic consequences associated with that, yeah, which the government spelled democracy... out, would be irresponsible. Sorry, I mean, you did very well overnight, obviously, but the Brexit party did better. And in terms of democracy, if there's a referendum, could you really say that there shouldn't be the opportunity for those who voted for the Brexit party last night to, to say we do want to leave without a deal? 
Well, we're, we're not yet at, at the stage, unfortunately, of deciding what the question on the ballot paper is going to be. But certainly what would need to be tested is if the government do come forward with no deal and say, oh, well, the result three years ago, that was an endorsement for no deal. Uh, I completely disagree with that. No one three years ago was arguing that no deal was on offer. On the contrary, they're all saying a, a fantastic, brilliant deal was on offer. Then we would most definitely have to put that to the test. Tom Brake, thank you very much. And uh, I will hand you back to the studio. We'll have more political reaction from here, though, a bit later. Thanks, Joanna. Yeah, let's get the thoughts now of the political scientist, eminent political scientist, I should say, Professor Sir John Curtis from the uh, University of Strathclyde. Uh, so, uh, John, lots of different political factions and parties trying to interpret these results, of course. Um, what's your reading of these results from the point of view of where this country stands now on the issue of Europe? Well, I think there are two lessons to take away. The first is that, basically speaking, we are still roughly evenly divided on the issue of Brexit. Um, if, for example, you take the level of support for the two parties that were arguing in favour of leaving without a deal and whose support we know from opinion polls comes virtually entirely from Leave voters, that's the Brexit party and UKIP, it's 35%. If you take the three parties that are not only in favour of a second referendum, but it's also clear are primarily drawing their voters from Remain voters, almost wholly from Remain voters. That's um, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens and Change UK. That's also 35 percent. Now, you might want to add the Nationalists, but we know that the SNP in particular get quite a lot of support from Leave voters. So, you know, that, that's that's more problematic. So anyway, two points to make. The first is that, roughly speaking, the express support for parties that were adopting either the second referendum or the no deal position was roughly equal. Second, neither of them got 50% of the vote or anything close to it. Mm. So you certainly can't argue that this is clear evidence that the public, a majority of the public want one or the other. What it is, it's confirmation that, not that these are majority preferences, but that these are the two most popular preferences. That's what the polls have been saying is for a while. And they motivate sufficient voters that voters were willing to move in one direction or the other rather than continuing to back either the Conservatives, who were also being punished because they had, had failed to deliver on Brexit, uh, but also the Labour Party, whose so-called constructive ambiguity finally seems to be struggling to retain both Remain and Leave of voters, something that seems that increasing numbers of the Labour Party seem to be acknowledging, although Jeremy Corbyn still doesn't seem quite to be able to say the world's clearer statement that he definitely wants a referendum, though he seems to have got a little bit closer towards it. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me just put to you what Nigel Farage, the sort of victorious leader of the Brexit party, was saying, that essentially these results are a mirror, a reflection of the original referendum result. If you look across the country, he says yep. it's about 52-48%. He says we are pretty much where we were three years ago, Things have not changed. People have not changed their minds. Well, uh, to what extent is that accurate? Uh, well, best evidence I can give you is from opinion polls, um, which have been regularly asking people how they vote in a referendum. Now, opinion polls are not infallible, but equally trying to discern people's attitudes from election results is also a fairly problematic exercise. They have pretty consistently now been saying 53, 54% for Remain, 46, 47% for Leave. So, yes, I agree with Nigel Farage. It's close. We are pretty evenly divided. Probably the balance of opinion is slightly in the opposite direction. But, and this is crucial, and almost undoubtedly um, it's a group that did not vote that heavily on Thursday. The Remain leave in the opinion polls rests primarily on the expressed views of those who did not vote in June 2016, many of whom are younger. And a crucial question would be whether they would turn out and vote. One thing I can tell you, you know, is that in the opinion polls, at least when they were being asked whether they would turn out last Thursday or not, this group was relatively disinclined to do so. So certainly, yes, we are close. Um, maybe the Remain have a bit of an advantage, but it's an advantage that may be built on sand rather than on concrete. <laughs> right, John, thank you very much indeed. Uh, right, let's go back to Westminster and more from Joanna. Thank you very much, Ben. More reaction here this time from the Conservative MP for North West Leicestershire and Brexiteer Andrew Bridgen. The area voted for the Brexit party with 43.3% of the share.
thank you for joining us. And uh, actually, Nigel Farage previously asked you if you'd like to be part of the Brexit party. Do you wish you'd said yes? No, I told Nigel I was stopping to fight for the heart and soul of the Conservative Party, <clears throat> ensuring that the withdrawal agreement bill didn't go through and that we have a Eurosceptic uh, leading the party uh, and deliver the Brexit we promise the British people. There's, a, there's an old saying which says that when the, when the people are scared of the politicians, that's tyranny. And when the politicians are scared of the people, that's democracy. Well, I think we had a good dose of democracy last night. And I hope that all the MPs in our parliament, those who've really never accepted the result of the referendum, I hope that they'll pay close attention to the results we saw in those European elections last night. And presumably then your reading of the result is the Tory party needs a candidate leading it that is going to deliver no deal Brexit on the 31st of October. I think one of the main problems with Theresa May is that uh, she never convinced the European Union that we were actually willing to leave with no deal, so we never ever had a chance of getting a deal that was acceptable. I'm not so concerned about no deal. There's been a lot of preparation for it, a lot of legislation has been passed both here and on the continent. And if we go with no deal, we can immediately trigger uh, GATT Article 24. We can offer the European Union reciprocal tariff and quota free trade exactly as we've got at the moment uh, until we you know, negotiate that detailed free trade agreement. So what you've said there is obviously what we heard, we've heard a lot over the months, which is the government position needed to be to convince the EU that we're serious about no deal and get a better deal. And all we said, but I mean, you know, the there's, no chance, the, the, but there's the, no chance now of, of a better deal, is there? We've got the deal that we've got. Well, the EU would hold that position, but if, if not, we have to leave on the 31st of October on a managed no deal and offer them GAP24. And they'd be stupid not to take it because they have a huge uh, trade surplus with us. Their, their economies are on, on the brink of recession. Um, why wouldn't they take it? Do you see a candidate who would take this country out of the EU on the 31st of October with no deal. Boris Johnson is sort of looked to as potentially that candidate. Do you think he would be? Would he do it? Well, he ha Boris, Dominic Raab, Esther McVeigh have all committed to leave with no deal. I would like to see those candidates come together and form an alliance of uh, Euroscepticism, to be sure. The fact is, whoever's the next leader of the Conservative Party, it's absolutely crucial that they are willing to get us out with no deal. We might, if we're lucky, get a second chance with the electorate. I can promise you there'll be no third chances if, if, that's, if they're let down again. When you talk about the electorate, I mean, when you look at the breakdown of uh, the, the voting last night, uh, anti-Brexit parties took around 40% of the vote and pro-Brexit 34.9%. The I mean, that's excluding the Labour and the Tories. That's the parties that were very specific. Well, what we're going to see, what we're going to see now is, with, with is the results for Labour were abysmal. They were very bad for the Conservative Party. You're going to see a realignment of Labour. They're controlled. No, but I'm not talking about that. Sorry, I'm talking about what the country at large said last said in these results in terms of being ready to leave without a deal or wanting to remain. Actually, the greater share was for the Remain party. You've got to bear in mind that this was a turnout in my seat of 33%. We turned out 79% at the referendum in 2016, and it was 61% for leave. If you add up the votes, this, it's, I mean, it's it about is what the same. It is. Everybody, you can't sort of guess what people who didn't vote might have voted. This, this is how people voted. This is how people voted. And they, anyone who's trying to spin that the Brexit party didn't romp it last night, I mean, they're, they're actually democracy deniers. We have a first-past-the-post system, which would have meant that the Conservative Party had no MPs at a general election if, if it was conducted on the basis of last night. We'd have had no Conservative MPs. There would have been about six or seven Labour MPs. Okay. This is a game changer. Anyone who says that the Brexit party didn't win those European elections last night is absolutely living in denial. Andrew Bridgen, thank you very much. We'll have more reaction from here later. For now, back to Ben. Thank you, Joanna. We're going to get more reaction now from uh, around Europe because our correspondent Anna Holligan's in the Netherlands for us. Um, Anna, what, were, what was the message from voters there? Well, uh, three main headlines from here in the Netherlands today. First of all, a resounding and shock of victory for the pro-European Labour Party. 
strong performance from Mark Rutte's Conservatives and the Eurosceptics failed to meet the extremely high expectations. So it was seen going into these elections as a fight on the right uh, between the new kid on the block, Thierry Baudet's Forum for Democracy, Nationalists and Mark Rutte's Conservatives. In the end, though, it was the Labour Party, Franz Timmermans, who won the day. 70% of voters in the Netherlands voted for pro-EU parties. We're also seeing the Greens very well represented here. And of course, there is talk of this Brexit effect. So what impact did Brexit have on voters here in the Netherlands, which is, of course, so exposed to the British economy? Well, it seems as though quite a lot. Dutch people are very concerned about the chaos, the labyrinth that the UK has apparently seemed to enter into. So leaving is seen as less appealing. Essentially, the one party that really pushed for an exit, that was uh, Geert Wilders Freedom Party, an exit of course being uh, the Netherlands exit from the EU was decimated. They got no seats whatsoever. But this is a quite a nuanced picture because it seems as though it was a battle between those Eurosceptic parties and the vote has been redistributed, although there has been a slight fall. So overwhelmingly, the, the view from the Netherlands, the position here is that they are pro-EU, but there is some degree of scepticism and the green issues are very much on the agenda. All right, Anna, thank you very much. That's Anna Holligan there for us in The Hague. We can go to Spain now, actually, and join our correspondent, Guy Hedgeco, who's in Madrid. And Guy, um, Spain returning the, what, the fifth biggest contingent, I think, to the European Parliament. And the pro-EU socialists doing pretty well. Yes, that's right. That's right. It was a very good result for Socialist Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez. Remember, he won a general election last month. Um, so... A lot of people were looking to this election to see if it was going to confirm that swing to the left that we saw in April. It did seem to confirm that swing. It was a good result for the socialists. They came in first, well ahead of the second place Conservative Popular Party, who lost ground um, in the, this European election. Um, and also remember that yesterday was something of a super Sunday because there were local elections being held across the country as well. The socialists performed very well in those for the most part. Um, but the far right uh, Vox party did uh, gain seats in the European Parliament for the first time. Spain is very pro-European for the most part, but and Vox is probably the most uh, anti-European of all the parties. But it didn't really talk much about the European issue or Spain's uh, relationship with Europe during this campaign. Um, it talked about other issues instead. But nonetheless, it does have three seats in the European Parliament, that far right Vox party. All right, Guy, thank you very much. That's the latest there from Madrid and the Spanish results. Uh, let's focus in now a little bit more on the results here in the UK, actually. We're going to hear from our correspondents in Scotland and Northern Ireland in a moment, where uh, counting is continuing. But first, a, a closer look, really, at the results in Wales, because the Brexit party have won the largest share of the vote with almost a third, 32%. Uh, Plaid Cymru gained second place with 20% of the vote and Labour in Wales came in third, that's with 15%. Uh, Liberal Democrats uh, closely behind with 14%, Conservatives in fifth place followed by the Greens. So uh, let us take you then to Cardiff and we can join our correspondent Arwen Jones who's there for us. Uh, just bring us up to date on the picture there in Wales because this has been, well let's call it a disaster really for the Labour Party in Wales. Yes, no doubt at all about that, Ben. The last time you have to, uh, the last time that Labour came third in a sort of a national election in Wales was back in 1910. So perhaps unsurprisingly, questions are now being asked well, what exactly went wrong last night for the party? Why are they third behind Plaid Cymru? The first time in the Nationalists' 90 year history that they've outperformed Labour in a poll like this. Uh, and the questions are being asked about what exactly uh, went wrong for the message on Brexit. Because even in the past, when Labour hasn't been doing very well, 
at a UK level. In Wales, they've managed to have this clear identity, a separate identity from uh, UK Labour, what's been called uh, clear red water. Now, the man who coined that phrase is actually the uh, current First Minister of Wales, the leader of the Welsh Labour government here, Mark Drakeford. But he stayed very close to Jeremy Corbyn in terms of messaging on a referendum. Now that's being called into question. Some very prominent members of his government, including the Brexit Minister, Jeremy Miles, the International Minister, Elinid Morgan, now saying we need to rethink our position on Brexit. For Plaid Cymru, outperforming Labour as they did last night, the big question is, well, can we uh, translate that support, that extra support, into uh, other elections? They're, we're less than two years away now from uh, Assembly elections in 2021. Will Plaid Cymru be able to outperform Labour uh, again there? We will have to wait and see, of course. And it's worth remembering that in that building there, the Senedd building, the, the Welsh Assembly here in Cardiff Bay, the Brexit Party already have four Assembly members. A couple of weeks ago, uh, four uh, AMs who used to be UKIP members defected to the Brexit Party. So they've already, already got uh, a sort of a, a stronghold there in the Welsh Assembly. Will they be able to replicate the success, the massive success that they saw there last night, gaining a third of the vote here in Wales, if it ever comes to, uh, to any uh, Assembly elections? All right, Arwen, thank you very much indeed. That's Arwen Jones there, our correspondent uh, in Cardiff with the latest from there. We'll have much more uh, from uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland, where they're still counting as well. Uh, more analysis and reaction to the European election results here on the uh, BBC News Channel. But let me just recap then where we are. There's been really a, a big blow to the biggest parties at Westminster. Um, the Brexit Party emerging as the clear winner in the poll for a new European Parliament formed only six weeks ago or so. Let's not forget Nigel Farage's party have won no fewer than 28 seats so far in the European Parliament. OK, uh, much more, as I say, coming up on the News Channel. But now we'll say goodbye to viewers on BBC Two. So, as promised, we're going to uh, continue our roundup around the United Kingdom and we're going to go to Scotland. Lorna Gordon's in Glasgow, where, um, well, the SNP are very, very happy with their, their night's work, aren't they, Lorna? Yeah, they, the last results have just come in here in Scotland. We're still waiting for the Scotland-wide tally, but we do know that the Western Isles result shows that the SNP topped the poll there as well. That means they topped the poll in 30 out of 32 local authorities here in Scotland. In fact, in some local authorities like Dundee, they were 30 points clear of their nearest ri rivals. This means they've secured their best ever European election result, uh, increased their share of the vote, and look set to send three MEPs uh, back to Brussels. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon has been speaking. She called this a historic victory, said it showed that Scotland had rejected Brexit once again. Uh, the First Minister speaking in Dublin this morning. She added to those comments. She criticised the London government for treating Scotland with utter contempt over Brexit. She pointed out that over 60% of Scotland voted to remain and she said uh, those people have been ignored. She also said she expects Scotland will vote for independence the next time a referendum is held. The leader of the SNP at Westminster, Ian Blackford, has also added to those comments. He suggested the result has cemented the case for a second referendum on Scottish independence in the case of a no deal Brexit. That's the story of the big winner here in Scotland. I think uh, it's interesting to point out the big loser, without a doubt, that is Labour. They had a dismal night. Five years ago, they came a close second here in Scotland. This time, their vote collapsed. They were fifth in the, the vote overnight. A dreadful, dreadful uh, night for them. Two, ME, two MPs, Ian Murray, Martin uh, Whitfield, have described this as a deeply upsetting campaign. Countless friends and supporters, they said, uh, told them personally they could not vote for Labour because of its position on Europe. And they said the blame for that lies squarely with the Labour, Labour leadership. Uh, one final point to note, of course, is that a million people voted for Brexit here in Scotland in that EU referendum three years ago. Their vote seems to have coalesced around the Brexit party. This party that's only been in existence for six or so weeks secured one MEP here in Scotland. 
Liberal Democrats have one MEP. The Conservatives also uh, have one MEP. Not a great night for them, but they might take some comfort from the fact that they had a higher share of the vote than elsewhere in the UK. So that's the story. But the big news from here in Scotland is that the SNP have won and they have won big. Yeah, indeed, Lorna, thank you. That's the, that's the view from uh, Scotland. Let's get the picture in Northern Ireland now. We can go to our Ireland correspondent, Emma Vardy, who's at a count in uh, Macrofelt, where they're... Are they still counting away behind you there, Emma? Yep, they absolutely are. Around 800 or so staff brought in uh, to do this mammoth count. Now, there's three seats up for grabs here in Northern Ireland. The two largest parties, the Democratic Unionists and Sinn Féin, uh, are expected to win one each. And the really interesting question is who that third seat will go to, whether it may buck the trend of the last 30 years and could go to a centre ground party, a party that neither designates itself as unionist nor nationalist. The Alliance Party is the one um, everybody's watching, spearheaded by Naomi Long. There has been a recent increase in support for centre ground parties here in Northern Ireland, those that don't define themselves along uh, sectarian lines. But for so long here, politics has been dominated uh, by the big unionist and nationalist community divide. This is perhaps the most interesting European elections for Northern Ireland of all its last 40 years. Now, we're a little bit behind the rest of the UK in terms of the, vote, the count because they only started here at 8 o'clock this morning. There's no vote counting on Sundays in Northern Ireland. The Christian tradition of uh, making Sundays a day of rest is the reason for that. So, yes, slightly behind the rest of the UK in terms of how far they are with the count. We're expecting perhaps one of the first results to come in um, sometime this afternoon. But counting here does take a little longer because Northern Ireland uses a slightly different voting system to the rest of the UK and that's because of this unique political setup in Northern Ireland where you need representation for both uh, the unionist and nationalist sides of the community. So uh, poised to be a very interesting result here to see whether a centre ground party could for the very first time take that very interesting third seat and really then the conversation would move on to what that says about Northern Ireland and the change that we're seeing uh, as the um, in the sort of post-conflict years if you like. All right, Emma, thank you very much indeed. Emma Vardy there, our Ireland correspondent. Uh, we're going to go back to Westminster now for more political reaction. Um, and Joanna Gosling's there. And Joanna, I suppose normally we talk about the smaller parties in British politics being squeezed, but last night it was the big parties, the, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party that were squeezed. It absolutely was, Ben, yes. I mean, their strategy of um, trying to keep on board their supporters, their traditional party supporters who have been split across uh, both sides of the, the debate on Brexit really did not win out last night. And it was the parties that had a very clear position, the Brexit Party, saying we would leave without a deal, that uh, won big, and the parties of Remain, the Liberal Democrats uh, winning big last night. The Liberal Democrats, who of course have been uh, pretty much written off here in Westminster, but it was a very different political game with those European elections, particularly with the fact that uh, the even though the, the, the vote, particularly on the Remain side of things, was split, because of proportional representation, it meant that uh, parties did win seats. And as you say, Ben, the real losers last night were uh, Labour and the Tories. The Tories' worst result uh, is being said for around 200 years. Let's get some reaction now from Gloucestershire. We can speak to Julie Girling. She's a former MEP for the South West region. She was uh, a Tory MEP, then resigned the Tory whip and uh, stood as an independent over Brexit, was actually put forward as a Change UK uh, uh, candidate in the elections, but decided not to stand because she had fears about splitting the vote. So thank you very much indeed for joining us, uh, Julie Girling. What is your view then on what, how things have unfolded? Well, I guess there's no real surprises. Um, it, it was looking as if this was going to happen and maybe the established Labour and Conservative going quite so low was a bit of a surprise. But it seems that the story really is a polarisation and it's extremely worrying, actually. Nobody should be jubilant, whatever side of the argument they're on. We are a very divided country and we need to work very hard to do something about that. The politicians failed, did they, with that strategy of, of, of trying to bridge it? I mean, trying to keep everybody happy, it seems, has kept no one happy. Well, unfortunately, I don't agree with the premise of your question. I don't think politicians tried very hard to bridge it at all until it was much, much too late and positions had really solidified. Certainly the government and the Tory party didn't try very hard. 
um, until it was much too late and then came forward with something they knew their hardliners would never accept. So it's complete failure from a political strategy point of view. Um, I think where we need to look now is to the middle ground. The Liberal Democrats have had a cracking uh, day yesterday, uh, last night, and I think we need to look to them now for leadership in terms of uniting the more progressive side of politics, certainly as far as the EU is concerned and other policies. Um, there are lots of voices on that side of politics in this country. Uh, Change UK didn't do very well. I think they were strategically poor, but the message they have is, is, a, is a good solid one. And the Liberal Democrat message is a good solid one. There are other parties like Renew with a good solid middle ground message, um, which I support. And I think we all need to now work very hard at the heart of British politics to get firstly the electoral system changed so that those voices can be heard. I so, think it's really strange okay, we're, we're, to hear we're, we're right out of time, but thank you very much. And, and uh, Julie Gerling really underlining that point there about the proportional representation. It was what the Liberal Democrats used to stand for strongly in Westminster. They never saw it delivered. Uh, whether those arguments now start to come back to the fore again, because, of course, proportional representation meant that a fragmentation of the vote in Europe last night did not mean that... Uh, the, uh, the, the seats for the various parties weren't delivered. We'll have much more reaction coming up in just a few moments. Right now, though, let's catch up with the weather. Simon King has the details. Thank you, Joanna. It's been rather mixed so far this bank holiday Monday. Some of us have had some dry weather with some sunshine. Elsewhere, we've had quite a few showers moving in. Those showers this morning have been mainly focused across Northern Ireland, into northwest England and across Wales. But you notice throughout the afternoon, those showers drift their way further south and eastward. And some of the showers could be on the heavy side, maybe even the odd rumble of thunder. Now, a fairly blustery westerly wind for England and Wales will keep temperatures up at about 17 to 19 degrees. But a northerly wind across Scotland and Northern Ireland will bring those temperatures down. So 9 to 13 Celsius, feeling quite cool here throughout the afternoon, even with a mixture of some sunny spells and showers. Through tonight, we'll keep a lot of showers across the UK. Overnight temperatures getting down to about 6 to 10 degrees Celsius. And then into Tuesday, showers mostly confined towards eastern parts of Scotland, eastern areas of England, where again, it could be heavy, maybe a little bit thundery. Further west, it's going to be a bit drier and sunnier. But for many of us, again, it's going to feel quite cool. Bye-bye. You're watching a BBC News EU election special. With the Brexit party a clear winner in the poll, the Liberal Democrats taking second place and a very tough night indeed for the Conservatives and the Labour Party. The Brexit party, formed only recently, are the big winners, gaining almost a third of the vote and 28 MEPs. We have got a mandate now and we want the government to include us in their negotiating team. We have got to get ready for leaving the European Union on October the 31st. There's an awful lot we can do. The Liberal Democrats who campaigned to stop Brexit come second with around 20% of the vote. And the Green Party makes significant gains, posting their best performance for 30 years. I'm Joanna Gosling at Westminster, where the two main parties have suffered heavy losses. Labour fall to third place overall, with less than 15% of the vote. Jeremy Corbyn says the party's position remains unchanged. What this party does is supports an agreement with the European Union to prevent crashing out, supports putting that proposal, when agreed, to a public vote. The Conservatives are pushed into fifth place with an historic low of less than 10% of the vote. The Children's Minister says it is time to rethink their strategy. It's a wake-up call to my colleagues in Parliament that we have to deliver on the instruction the British people gave us in 2016 in the Brexit referendum. In Scotland, the SNP have dominated the poll, winning 38% of the vote. We're expecting the final declaration shortly. And in Wales, Labour are pushed into third place behind the Brexit party in Plaid Cymru. And we'll bring you all the results and indeed the picture across Europe, where turnout is up and the traditional parties have lost out to smaller ones.
Hello and welcome to this BBC News EU election special. Well, in a major blow for the largest parties at Westminster, the Brexit party have emerged as the clear winner in the poll for a new European Parliament. Formed only recently, Nigel Farage's party have won 28 seats so far and received almost a third of the share of the vote. Both Labour and the Tories posted some of their worst results ever while the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, who both oppose Brexit, have increased their vote and number of seats. Well, in the last hour or so, Jeremy Corbyn has been giving his reaction to Labour's results, saying that the party's position has not changed, but that it has a responsibility to listen and to ensure a public vote on any Brexit agreement. Well, with 10 out of 12 regions declared, let's take a look now at the results in a little more detail. And it is, as we've been saying, the Brexit party that have gained the largest share of the vote, uh, almost a third with 32%. Liberal Democrats took second place with 20%. That's up 13 points compared to their result in the last EU elections in 2014. Labour came in third with 14%. That is down 11 points on last time round. And the Greens increased their support, gaining 12%. The Conservatives, they fell to a historic low with just 9% of the vote, putting them in fifth place. And although we are waiting for final results in Scotland, the SNP, we know, already have polled very strongly. While the UK Independence Party's vote fell heavily to just 3%, and the New Change UK Party also failed to make any impact with just 3% share. Now, 73 seats in the European Parliament in total were up for grabs, with the Brexit Party so far winning 28 seats, the Liberal Democrats 15 seats. They gained just one back in 2014, by the way. Labour have 10 MEPs, losing eight. The Greens have more than doubled their number of seats with seven MEPs. That's up four. And the impact on the Conservative Party, they're very clear for you to see. They have got just three members of the European Parliament. That is down 15. Plaid Cymru have won one seat. That's after beating Labour in Wales. Well, the final results in Scotland will be declared soon. Counting in Northern Ireland got underway this morning. Uh, let's get this report now from our political correspondent, Tom Barton. And a warning, it does contain some flash photography. If one party was expected to capitalise on a stalemate in the Brexit process, it was the Brexit party. And they were the clear winners of the night, taking almost a third of the vote and 29 MEPs. The party's leader saying that this could be just the start. Our primary goal is to get this country to be independent and self-governing. If that doesn't happen, and if we don't leave on the 31st of October, then what you will see is the Brexit party stunning everybody at the next general election. It wasn't just a good night for the Brexit party. One, two. At the other end of the spectrum, those standing on a clear Remain platform, including the Lib Dems and the Greens, also made great leaps forward. It's the first time in 100 years that we've beaten both the Conservative and the Labour Party in the same election. And we are clearly able to demonstrate that both the Conservative and Labour Party did badly because they were absolutely split, couldn't articulate what they wanted on Brexit. We've been very clear we are the strongest Remain party. The one thing that is clear from this result is that voters don't like the tightrope walk Brexit compromises that the two main parties have been offering up to now. What then does that mean for the future? Well, both for Labour and the Conservatives, it means that they're going to be under pressure to adopt simpler, clearer positions. For the Tories, devastation at the polls is likely to see leadership candidates taking even tougher positions. This is um, the worst result in our party's history in uh, uh, elections. Um, and it's a wake-up call to my colleagues in Parliament that we have to deliver on the instruction the British paper people gave us in 2016 in the Brexit referendum. For the Labour leadership, the pressure is in the opposite direction, to back another referendum. What you have from me today is a commitment that our party is listening to its members and its supporters 
and reaching out to other parties across the House of Commons to prevent a crashing out from the European Union with no deal. A commitment that the future will of course be put to a public vote as we have already proposed in Parliament. So the votes have been counted, the results far from clear cut. The country is still divided. Any end to the Brexit debate a long way off. Tom Barton, BBC News, Westminster. Well, I'm here in Westminster where it has been a tough night for both the Conservatives and Labour, as we were hearing. The Tory leadership race is, of course, already underway and last night is likely to have a big impact on how Theresa May's prospective successor pitches their Brexit solution. Labour also lost ground and there are also questions, as we've been hearing, as to what the party's future policy should be. With me is our assistant political editor, Norman Smith. Um, lots of trying to work out exactly what these parties need to do now, Norman. Well, I think both of them face a sort of moment of truth because quite clearly their existing strategy is not working. Um, both the main parties were hammered last night. Uh, Labour down at 14 per cent, Tories down at 9 per cent. I would imagine now on the Tory side there'll be absolutely colossal pressure to, pressure to try and see off the threat of Nigel Farage by pretty much committing to leave on October the 31st come what may. And so therefore you'd imagine MPs and Tory party members are likely to go for a new leader who is a no-nonsense, no-dealer. That would seem to me to be where they're heading. And on the Labour side, we are now seeing a real push to try and get Jeremy Corbyn off the fence and to back the idea um, of another referendum. We've heard from Emily Thornbury last night. We've heard from Keir Starmer this morning, John McDonnell, Diane Abbott making similar sort of remarks. Mr Corbyn, meanwhile, I kind of think he's still on the fence because when you listen to what he says, you know, everyone's trying to interpret what he says, which rather says to me he's as ambiguous as ever, and you can read it pretty much any way you want. I think the brutal truth is it's probably too early for him to make any sort of substantive move. I think where the pressure will come now will be the, for the demands to let the membership decide. Say, OK, if there's no consensus, let's put it back to the members. And you could see that as being a way for Labour to move policy on Brexit. Mr Corbyn talked about... Uh, having a decision at the party conference. If that is the case, then I think we kind of know that the party membership is overwhelmingly Remain referendum. So it would seem to me very hard for Mr Corbyn to stand by his existing position. All right, he can hold it for now, but I would think incrementally and over the weeks ahead, he is going to slowly, gradually be pushed towards backing another referendum, particularly if the Tory party is going in the opposite direction of backing no deal, which means we will be back to pretty much where we were in 2016, uh, the original referendum, where you've got, you know, the Tories <clears throat> more the Brexiteery party and Labour more the Remainery party. And I think that sort of division has never gone away. Is there time, though, for that debate to unfold? Or in the end, could it all just be a lot of hot air? Because that 31st of October, October deadline is going to mean that there's a very... It is there a timetable? Well, it absolutely could. If you look at where we are now, May, we've got the next two months sucked into a Tory leadership contest. If they're lucky, they get it done and dusted by the end of July. We've got the October 31st deadline ahead. Trouble is, that is the summer and, you know, basically Brussels closes down. This place pretty much closes down. More to the point, the new European Commission doesn't move in until November the 1st, so there is no way the old fag-end Commission is going to reopen the withdrawal agreement and then proffer up a new deal when they know that a new Commission is coming in. So the chances of any um, new deal being concocted, even in those few months left, seems to me to be close to zero, which means unless something extraordinary happens, we are heading towards no deal, which then raises the question mark, can it be avoided? Well, you're into really deep territory there. We heard from Philip Hammond yesterday saying that, you know, if people like him were confronted with the possibility of a Tory government taking Britain out of the EU without a deal, then people like him might have to consider voting against his own party in a no-confidence vote. So you but are would, talking... But would doing that stop it? Because, I mean, triggering a general election, that would anything stop what is it in place right now, which is the legislation to leave on the 31st? Well, maybe not, but it technically or in theory maybe not but it seems to me 
almost inconceivable that a Tory leader would willingly allow himself to be pushed into a general election, which is what would happen, I presume, if they lost a vote of no confidence, because based on last night and the local elections, they would be annihilated. Um, the other option, of course, is the EU decide, OK, new leader, we'll give, them, give you a bit more time again, because they have a vested interest, I guess, in avoiding a no deal. They want to retain close economic ties, if at all possible. So despite the sort of mood music from Brussels being, that's it, time's up, we're not going to give you another extension, it's, it's not impossible that they could decide again, OK, we'll give you guys one last go with a new leader, new reality, maybe common sense will kick in, but this is really your last chance. It, it's not impossible. Um, you know, is the last chance saloon the last chance saloon? I don't know, maybe sort of opening hours will last a bit longer. It's happened before. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Norman. Much more reaction here a little bit later. Right now, back to you, Ben. Joanna, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's just take a look at the overall results then across the rest of Europe and indeed the spread of seats in the European Parliament. So the big centre-right and centre-left blocs have lost their combined majority amid an increase in support for Liberals, Greens and Nationalists. Pro-EU parties are still expected to be in a majority, but the traditional blocs will need to seek new alliances. The Liberals and Greens had a good night, while the Nationalists were victorious in Italy, France and, of course, in the UK. But the centre-right European People's Party does remain the largest bloc, and analysts say it's likely to form a grand coalition with Socialists and Democrats bloc, with support from Liberals and the Greens. Negotiations and horse trading lie ahead. Uh, meanwhile, turnout was uh, up considerably. Figures have risen to 51%. That's up from 42.6% last time round in 2014. Now, the turnout bucked a long trend of decline in voter numbers. It was actually the best since 1994. Uh, Lee Milner has more on that. For some, it's been a night of celebration. For others, commiseration. Over 28 million people voted in 28 countries across the European Union, the highest turnout in 20 years. Perhaps the biggest winner amongst the nationalist parties, though, was in Italy, where Italian Deputy Prime Minister Matteo Salvini boosted his right-wing league party to become the number one party in Italy. It is not only the Lega that is the first in Italy. Marie Le Pen has the first party in France. Nigel Farage is the first party in Britain. So Italy, France, Great Britain. It is the sign of a Europe that is changing. Overall, mainstream parties that make up a coalition in the 751-seat parliament looks to be lost. The centre-right bloc in light blue looks like it will still have the most seats. Its coalition partner, the Socialists in red, will still be in second. Both the Liberals and the Greens have made significant gains, though, and perhaps will be part of a future coalition. For us, it's very clear. We are the Greens and we want to put green policies into place. So um, we want to vote for policies of climate protection. We want to make sure we create a social Europe which is with social protection for everyone. Elsewhere, populist parties have gained ground in a number of countries, including France, where Marine Le Pen won her head-to-head -head battle with President Macron. Je vois la victoire du peuple. I see in this a victory of the people who have taken power back tonight with fierceness and dignity. We welcome these results with joy, and the national rally's name has never been more fitting. France will hardly be any time for the next bit of important business for the EU, as leaders are due to meet tomorrow at a special summit to decide who's going to get those top jobs, including the presidencies of the Council and Commission. Lee Milner, BBC News. Right, we're going to uh, focus in on the results from Scotland because uh, voting there is now complete. We were waiting for the results from the Western Isles, but now it's all complete. So we can show you those results now as we have them. There it is, the SNP, 38%. Uh, the big winners, really, in Scotland, 38% share. The Brexit Party next with 15%. The Liberal Democrats, 14%. The Conservatives... 12% Labour, right down there on just 9% in Scotland. The Green Party, 8%. Change UK, 2%. And UKIP, 2% as well. So that's 
A big boost for the SNP, up 9% on last time round. The Brexit party up even more, uh, well, uh, plus 15%. Uh, the Liberal Democrats up 7%. So there we are. In terms of seats, the SNP uh, have half the number of seats. Three, the Brexit Party won, the Liberal Democrats won, and the Conservatives won. Labour have no seats, the Greens have no seats. And these are the new elected members of the European Parliament in Scotland there. Uh, Alan Smith, uh, Christian Allard for the SNP, for the Brexit Party, Louis Stedman Bruce for the Liberal Democrats, Sheila Ritchie. The other, the third SNP member of the European Parliament is Aileen MacLeod and the single Conservative there, Noshina Mubarak. So uh, that is the results completed. We work waiting for them to be completed from Scotland. Now they have been. We know exactly what's happened. The SNP winning almost 38% share, 37.7% in fact is the exact total of their share. Right, let's go back to Westminster, where all of this is being digested and the political implications from these European elections, uh, which are pretty seismic implications, it has to be said. Joanna is there gauging reaction for us. Thank you very much, Ben. Yes, there's already a Tory leadership battle underway and the results last night will, of course, play into that. Labour are also scrutinising their position and uh, whether that uh, position that they have had, which is to try to keep all aspects of uh, party support across the country by uh, saying that they would deliver on the referendum result but wanted there to be a deal, has failed and when it, whether it's now time to show more clarity because, uh, of course, it was the party that showed real clarity in the European elections that won big. So let's go to Newcastle and uh, speak to the Labour MP for North West Durham, Laura Pidcock. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Good afternoon. Labour's strategy failed, didn't it? Is it now time for a change? I think there was, um, there's definitely so much that we can learn from these results. I'm not going to say that it was our best election results ever. It clearly, it clearly wasn't and we have to really reflect on that. What Labour has always tried to do is respect that result of the referendum but know that there are economic realities to leaving uh, the European Union and that we have to mitigate those. Uh, so I think that we've always tried to uh, bring the country together. You know, I've always kind of refused to see my constituents as either leave or remain. They are people who are enduring nearly the 10th year of austerity and we have to have answers to that. I think that what these European Union elections, sorry, these uh, European Parliament elections have done is, 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 is further display the divisions that exist in society. So people were motivated to go out and vote for the Brexit party. People were motivated to go out and vote for people who gave clear, simplistic uh, messages on the doors. The Labour Party were trying to do and are doing the morally right thing of saying that we need to respect the result of the referendum but understand those economic realities of leaving this union that we've been part of for a long time. So, I mean, what you're outlining there has been um, so, sort of packaged together in the sort of political phrase of constructive ambiguity. Can, can ambiguity ever really be constructive in political terms when we've seen how the, the people have voted? Is it now time, as many within the Labour Party are saying, time for absolute clarity? And that means saying that Labour is the party of Remain. People have made clear they want a choice and it's Labour that should stand up and say we're the party of Remain now. I don't think it was ambiguity. I think it's quite clear to say that we, we respect the result of the referendum, and that actually there are economic there are so there are economic realities to leaving that union. I think you're right in the sense that we have to now reflect on this political reality. You know, the Conservatives had their worst result in 200 years, if not ever, in any elections, and I'm sure they are also reflecting on their situation. But what that means for them is they are probably going to take an even harder swing to the right, somebody that would commit to a no-deal Brexit. And then there is an implication on the Labour Party to do whatever we can in any circumstance to stop that no-deal Brexit. You're talking in terms still... Um in terms of what what you would you know what you want it to be you said it, it, the party has the moral high ground in terms of the policy but we are where we are and we're heading for brexit on the 31st of october and labor have been 
sort of pushed to to come up to, to say that they will firmly support a second referendum. Jeremy Corbyn this morning is not indicating that that's where Labour will be. In the absence of any real clarity, will we just end up with a no deal Brexit? I think I think what's happened it's not it's not about a pushing is it it's about understanding the political realities that are in front of us at each stage what this government have done uh, is is turn every day into you know an, an emergency because they're so they're so uh, in internal dispute with each other that um, we, we've ended up in a crisis situation so the Labour Party has moved towards a position where we are saying there will be someone that leads the Tory party who is 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 comfortable with economic sabotage, is comfortable to say that we'll leave uh, without a deal. The Labour Party are not comfortable with that and therefore we are saying any deal that could be negotiated should be put to a, to a public vote. There has to be uh, for the Labour Party, and, and I'll say this really clearly, a, 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 a pause, a reflection, let's go back to our members. You have to remember that we are a democratic party, our, our policy is made by the members. Gone are the days where shadow cabinet members can just make policies up on the hoof. And I think there will be a you know, there will be a period of reflection where we say, uh, how do we stop a no deal Brexit? How do we make sure that um, we, we stop the economic sabotage that would come from whoever the new Tory leader is going to be? Thank you very much, Laura Pidcock. Well, Thanks. we can talk now here to Georgina Wright, a senior researcher on the Brexit team at the Institute for Government. Um, welcome. So, Labour say they want to stop a no deal Brexit, they want time to reflect. Um, is is there time? Or is this where are we heading for no deal Brexit? What can stop it? I mean, basically, the only way to stop no deal um, is either to pass a deal or to stop the process altogether. Now, a new prime minister could also decide to, to make that incredibly difficult. Um, so it's unclear, but at the moment, the legal default remains no deal. Um, what is your reading of the results last night and what the country has said? I mean, obviously the UK uh, in these elections voted on Brexit. Brexit was the central issue and that came as no surprise. Obviously the two main parties um, didn't do well, but that was also very predictable. I think what you're seeing is a real polarisation in UK politics where everything is seen through the prism of remain versus leave. Now what that means for the country's future it is a big question and I think the real challenge for the new leader of the Conservative Party, if he or she becomes Prime Minister, is how do I unite not only my party but also the country? Is it now time to, to look beyond uniting parties because that's exactly what Labour and the Tories have tried to do mm. and they've just not been able to do it? Well, Did the parties break down and and reform. We saw obviously Change UK hiving off some mm. MPs from both of the parties, mm. but mm. I mean they were they've not delivered much overnight. I mean it was a good night for the Brexit Party, but it was also a very good night for the Greens and for the Liberal Democrats. And absolutely you're seeing sort of new kind of not new parties, but certainly parties that are gaining popularity and you know a polarization um, in a system where it's been dominated really by two or two and a half parties for, for, for decades. And you're really sensing a frustration um, among the electorate thinking, we don't trust you, the Conservative Party, to deliver and we just don't trust you, the opposition, Labour, to deliver either. Um, it's going to be very interesting because this polarisation isn't just unique to the UK. Um, across the EU you've also seen new constellations, new kind of um, political families um, taking place in the European Parliament and how that impacts EU policy going forward is going to be very interesting. So with such a polarisation then, does there need to be absolute clarity from the traditional two main parties at Westminster because in a system without proportional representation, unless there is, it's what will happen? I mean those results last night obviously mm -hmm. delivered in terms of proportional representation so even though the Remain parties were fragmented, they, they yeah. each got representation in the end. I mean, there's certainly a demand for clarity, but of course, even if you kind of find a consensus on how to proceed on Brexit here in Westminster, that doesn't necessarily mean that the EU will agree to that. They've been very firm throughout this process and said, look, actually, we believe that the best deal is already on the table. It, 
reflects months of negotiations that have been complex and at times quite tedious, um, you need to tell us how, what you're going to do because we feel the best offer is already on the table. And something you also hear when you go travel around the EU is they say, it seems to us that most of your frustrations don't lie in the withdrawal issues, which is what this agreement is about, um, but very much about the future, what kind of trading relationship you want with us, what kind of security relationship with, you want with us. And I think all these parties are going to have to give much more clarity to what kind of future they want, um, whether that is close alignment with the EU or, or, or drifting away. I haven't asked anybody the question yet today, what do you think will happen? Because it's a question obviously we keep putting and I mean I think it is clear that we, we really don't know what will happen. But do you think, what do you think will happen? Do you think there is any way that we will go beyond the 31st of October or will that prove to be a hard deadline? I mean, I, I, I don't know, to be honest. Like everyone, I'm watching this um, with curiosity. Um, obviously, last night's uh, result indicates that there is, as I said, huge polarisation and a need for clarity. Whether that can be provided for the 30, by the 31st of October remains to be seen. Um, there is a possibility that the UK leaves on the 31st of October with no deal. There's a possibility that the UK leaves after the 31st of October with no deal. Um, everything hinges on who replaces Prime Minister May, whether or not they can form a government that can you know, survive and what that means for the whole Brexit process. I think the next couple of weeks are going to be crucial. Georgina Wright, thank you very much and I will hand you back to Ben for now. All right, Joanna, thank you very much indeed. Joanna Gosling there for us at Westminster. Well, the newly formed Change UK party failed to win any seats, uh, despite having a number of high-profile candidates, including Rachel Johnson, sister of the Conservative leadership frontrunner Boris Johnson, of course. Uh, Change UK MP Anna Soubry has criticised the party's interim leader, Heidi Allen, for allegedly telling supporters to engage in tactical voting. Uh, it was a bad night for the UK Independence Party, who lost all 23 seats they won back in 2014, including the party's leader, Gerard Batten. Carl Benjamin, the YouTuber who was uh, surrounded in controversy over comments he made about the Labour MP Jess Phillips, failed to win a seat for the party in the South West. Former English Defence League organiser Tommy Robinson, who ran as an independent candidate in the North West under the real name Stephen Yaxley Lennon, also failed to win a seat. Now, two candidates with the same name but opposing parties were elected for the same region. Alexandra Phillips is now a Brexit uh, Party MP for the South East region, while Alexandra Phillips for the Greens is a Green Party MEP also for the South East region. How confusing is that? <laughs> I'm not going to ask uh, Professor Sir John Curtis to make sense of that one, but I am going to ask him for his analysis analysis of the results. Let's start, uh, John, with Scotland, because we've had all the results in now, yep. and obviously a very good night for the SNP. Uh, good, not astounding. I mean, the, 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 the one thing that the SNP have managed to do that neither the Conservatives nor Labour managed to do was A, to be a dominant party and hang on to their support during the European election campaign. And essentially the 38% they got is in line with what polls have also been telling us as to what would happen to the party if there were to be an early general election or they indeed a, a Scottish Parliament election. That said, we should remember that the 38% of the vote they've got is only about one point better than they got in 2017, which is why Degreet is a bit of a disaster. So, um, but I think the crucial thing is they hung on. And also, crucially, they're the one party that was able to uh, bridge the Remain Leave divide. We know that around 25% of Leave voters voted for the SNP, even though the party is now firmly in favour of a second EU referendum, because, of course, at the end of the day, the mm. SNP can also attract issue, uh, voters because of the issue of independence. So the SNP have been able to ride the Brexit tiger as a dominant party, retain mm. their support, mm. and that's their achievement. Um, but uh, beyond, uh, the, and frankly, then no, nobody else is left behind, and uh, everybody else is left behind. And what it's done north of the border is that, you know, hitherto the Conservative Party has been able to present themselves mm. as the, the uh, unionist party that was now riding high, was advancing, was reviving, um, and that therefore it was able to take on and challenge the SNP. Well, that record looks a little mm. broken this morning, although intriguingly, in perhaps a little, little Anorak's point, um, actually, the Conservative vote in Scotland was higher mm. than in any other region of Britain, which in itself is perhaps against oh, yeah. just how badly the party did uh, south of the border. But of course, the perhaps most astonishing thing was that the Labour Party came fifth 
it failed to retain any of its seats. So Scotland, which, you know, once upon a time, only three or four years ago, was a Labour fiefdom. The party's been crumbling badly north of the border. It is crucial to Jeremy Corbyn's chances of becoming prime minister because it's full of marginal seats. But the party's taken yet a further step backwards. And I suspect this may lead to question marks about the leadership of Richard Leonard, the leader of the Scottish Labour Party north of the border, who has struggled to make much of an impression on the party, although he is known to be on the, on the electorate, although he is known to be extremely loyal to Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. So, and that really is the story of the night in many ways, isn't it? Because normally in British politics we talk about small parties being squeezed by the big parties, but yeah. in a sense what happened last night was the big parties, Labour and the Conservatives, were squeezed by the smaller parties. They were. Now, the truth is the European Parliament elections are a bit different from other yeah. elections. We've long known that... Uh, voters are more willing to vote for small parties in European elections and they're particularly likely to vote for Eurosceptic parties. So, insofar as this was an election in which neither the Conservatives nor the Labour Party were presenting a clear message on Brexit, about two, two thirds of voters were saying, oh, we frankly struggle to know where these parties stand on Brexit. So, in far, that was the case. Insofar as voters on the Leave side had good reason to want to give the government a kicking, and we know that European elections are, are ideal for protest voting, against that backdrop this was in a sense a perfect storm you know if voters were ever going to actually uh, uh, de defect from conservative and labor this was when they were going to do it the point is they did it and above all they didn't just do it on the leave side which we were expecting they also began to show signs of doing it on the remain side which we weren't expecting and that therefore as a result there is as we can already see this morning a substantial debate inside the Labour Party about whether it needs to shift we knew the Conservatives were in trouble we knew that the Tory leadership contest was going to be dominated about what to do about Brexit we didn't know until the early hours this morning the Labour Party was also going to face internal mm -hmm. angst about Brexit but it's also now clear that they are going to do so as well. So what are the implications for a general election, both in terms of, A, whether there might be a, an early general election, uh, and B, whether you know, people, as you say, switching from their normal yep. party of allegiance to a different party, would they do the same in a general election? OK, well, there are two parts to that. The first is, is it, I think it's made the prospect of a, what I would call a voluntary general election, that is, the next Tory Prime Minister voluntarily going to the country, reduced because I think it's become clear that it's unlikely that the Conservative Party could do well enough to win a general election until it actually delivers Brexit. That too many of those people, not all of them will vote, will, will vote for the Brexit Party in general election, but enough of them would to do the Conservatives too much damage. On the other hand, maybe the risk of what we might call an accidental Brexit, uh, 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 accidental general election, uh, will it come about. And that's what Norman Smith was talking about earlier, about 10 minutes ago, and pointing out that perhaps the next Conservative leader will feel impelled to leave the European Union on October the 31st, even if there isn't a deal. But then that will raise the question as to whether or not Conservative MPs might bring the government down. As to what are the prospects for, uh, uh, for the general election? Well, uh, certainly uh, the Liberal Democrats' success is being mirrored in their current standing in the Westminster polls. And I think we could certainly anticipate in the moment that that party would, be, would pose more of a challenge than it did in 2015 or 2017. The SNP would probably gain seats north of the border. The Brexit party might not win very many seats, but I've already said could do to the Conservatives a lot of damage. What that might be pointing to, what it might be pointing to Labour coming first, but, but are both Labour and the Conservatives probably struggling to win an overall majority, look forward to another hung parliament mm. in which a minority administration is formed by a divided party that is reliant on the support of another party that is going to be fairly tough as a, uh, a supporter of that minority administration. We could just simply get a whole sense of deja vu, albeit coming from the other side of the political spectrum. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor John Curtis, with his thoughts on what all these results mean. Uh, let us head to Westminster for more reaction. Uh, Joanna's got that for us. Hi, Joanna. Thank you very much. Hi. Well, uh, we are going to speak now to the former Labour MEP, Mary Honeyball, who announced her resignation from the party after polls closed on Thursday. Um, so that's it. You're 
out of politics but still talking politics and what what are your thoughts on on how things have unfolded well it's obviously been very bad for the Labour Party but even worse for the Conservatives and what we should take note of although Nigel Farage has had so much publicity and you would think that the Brexit Party conquered all it actually hasn't if you add up the votes the percentage of the votes of the remain parties the parties who stand uh, stood unequivocally for remain the Lib Dems the Greens the SNP Plaid Cymru and Change UK they actually got a higher percentage of the vote uh, than, than the Brexit Party um, they, they were six percent ahead so I think we should not see this as a victory for Nigel Farage and the Brexit Party in actual fact more people voted for remain parties than voted to leave the EU in terms of what it means for politics here, though, it's no more than effectively an opinion poll, is it? Because it doesn't change anything in terms of the dynamic here. And actually, um, the a, a beneficiary of, of what Nigel Farage delivered in Europe might be somebody like Boris Johnson. Almost it's looking um, very likely that, that um, the beneficiary would be the, late, the, the Tory party now getting a leader who, who is going to say, right, we do leave on the 31st of October, deal or no deal. And, and anything that the Labour Party say at the moment isn't going to change that. Well, I think there's two aspects to this. I mean, you're absolutely right. And it will undoubtedly have an effect on the Conservative Party leadership, which, of course, the way our system works will mean that that person will become the Prime Minister. Yes, of course it will affect that. But I think we also need to think about the effect it, it has had on the result of the referendum. The Conservative Party and the Labour Party have both talked we must honour the result of the referendum. Well, we've now had another nationwide poll and that result is different from the 2016 referendum. So there has been a shift. I agree, not a very big shift, but there has been a shift in how public it, how opinion is it different? at the because, ballot box. Because, I mean, OK, if you, look, if you add together the support for no-deal Brexit and you add together the support for Remain parties uh, in these elections, Remain has a larger proportion. But when you bring in the Tories and the Labour, both of whom's policy is to leave, then the country is very heavily what well, this would indicate, heavily in favour of leaving. Well, that's actually not true of Labour policy. The, po the problem well, with... Labour's policy is we'll honour the referendum result, which is well, we leave. Well, it's more confused than that, sadly, and that's been one of its problems, because the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn has tried to face both ways. So we'll honour the referendum result and we'll respect leavers, but we'll also try and do something for those who voted Remain. Clearly it's failed, and I think if you ask John Curtis or anyone else who deals with elections, they will say to you that in that tranche of Labour voters there are quite a lot who voted Remain. Obviously we can't break that down, but we shouldn't assume that all Conservative and all Labour voters have voted Leave, because that's just not true. But what we do know is that the people who did vote for Remain parties outnumber those who explicitly voted for the Brexit party and we need to hold on to that because I think we're seeing quite a change and I think that will work forward as we go through all of this. Mary Honeyball, thank you very much indeed for joining us. More reaction from here a little bit later. For now, back to Ben. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, we just had some reaction in from the Prime Minister, actually. I think we can see that on Twitter. A very disappointing night for Conservatives says Theresa May, some excellent MEPs have lost their seats, some excellent candidates missed out. But Labour have also suffered big losses. It shows the importance of finding a Brexit deal. And I sincerely hope these results focus minds in Parliament. So that's the reaction from Theresa May, just there on Twitter, just coming into us. And uh, we'll get more from that a little bit later, no doubt. Let's uh, talk to our reality check correspondent, Chris Morris, who, who's here with us. Um, Chris, let's first of all talk about the Brexit Party. Um, a curious phenomenon, really, only formed quite recently. No manifesto, but a very clear message, I suppose, um, to voters on Brexit. Yeah, a clear message, let's leave and let's leave as soon as we can. But as you suggest, not much detail in there. I mean, you can slice up the percentages any way you like, but it's very clear this is the party that won this election. And this was Nigel Farage's basic message. We want a clean break Brexit. It's interesting, he very rarely used the term in the election campaign, no deal Brexit, which is what most people would call what he wants. 
when he talks about a clean break, he means no withdrawal agreement with the, with the EU. Rip up what's been agreed between the government and the EU and just leave. That would mean that, that all the laws we've put together and all the rules we've had which govern our relationship with the EU over more than 40 years would disappear overnight. Now, the Brexit Party's argument is we can be pretty hard-nosed during that and we can still get some sort of agreement with the EU nevertheless. But they're not exactly making it easy for themselves because one of the key things they've said, one of the few specifics they've said, is that the £39 billion, remember the divorce deal, uh, the financial agreement that the UK has agreed to pay the EU over a number of years, he said we wouldn't pay any of that. Now, that's not exactly going to persuade the EU to, to you know, act cooperatively because they think that's money which is, which is owed to them under international law. Overall, Mr Farage's big pitch, and we've heard similar things from some Conservative leadership candidates, is we want to leave on what he calls WTO, World Trade Organisation terms. Yeah, and talk to us a bit more about that, because this is going to become more and more impor important, potentially, and, and part of the Conservative Party leadership contest, this whole discussion about what a no-deal Brexit might mean. Yeah, and, and th this term we're going to hear time and time again. It doesn't actually mean very much in a way because the rules of the World Trade Organization are the very basic building blocks of international trade. Uh, and then countries put other things on top of them to have things like free trade agreements and so forth. They don't, on their own, give you very many benefits at all when you trade with other countries. Now, what the Brexit Party and others say is, don't worry, there's this thing called Article 24 we can use, which means we can still trade without any tariffs or taxes on goods crossing borders between the UK and the EU. But to do that, you need to have an agreement. You can't impose that Article 24 on another party. You'd need to have an agreement with the EU to do so. And of course, the Brexit party just say well, they want to leave without any, any agreement. And, and then you get to what the EU might want from all that. If there was to be uh, no deal Brexit and we leave, you obviously need to start talking to the EU about something sooner rather than later. But the EU's priorities, they've said very clearly, the other 27 countries have agreed this, the first thing we want to talk about would not be a free trade agreement, it would be these rather familiar issues we've heard about for more than a year now, the divorce bill, the Irish border and citizens' rights, precisely those things that are at the heart of the withdrawal agreement that Theresa May and her negotiators so painfully drew up with the EU. So simple slogans and simple solutions from the Brexit party which have attracted a lot, a lot of support but the complexity of the Brexit process hasn't gone away. Chris thank you very much indeed. Uh, Chris Morris there our reality check correspondent. Uh, let's have a closer look now at the results in Wales because the Brexit party uh, won the largest share of the vote there with almost a third 32%. Uh, Plaid Cymru gained second place with 20% of the vote. Labour came in third with 15%. Liberal Democrats closely behind with 14%. Uh, the Conservatives fifth place followed by the Greens. So that's the situation uh, in Wales. We can go to Arwen Jones actually who's in Cardiff with the latest there. This uh, Arwen, well a really terrible night for the Labour Party in Wales. Yes, that's right, Ben. And questions coming thick and fast about what exactly happened there. You need to look at the context here. The last time that Labour came third in a national election in Wales was in 1910. And since then, the party has topped pretty much every Wales-wide election since then, until last night when they came third. Now, uh, Labour, you have to remember, is a party of government in Wales. In that building, the Senedd building behind me there, there is a Labour First Minister in Mark Drakeford. Now, he stuck very closely to Jeremy. Jeremy Corbyn's message on Brexit are not going full throttle for another referendum and that's being criticised today by some very senior members of the Welsh Government Cabinet. The Health Minister, the latest now to come out saying that it was a mistake. The Brexit Minister and the International Relations Minister, all three of them saying that they need to rethink the policy on Brexit, hold another referendum uh, on, on Brexit. Uh, of course it's been a much better night for Plaid Cymru coming second, beating Labour in this national uh, election for the first time in their 90-year history and that's why Plaid Cymru's leader Adam Price is saying that the tectonic plates in Welsh politics have shifted as a result of the, what we saw last night. Whether or not that 
proves out to be true, of course, remains to be seen. But as elsewhere, the Brexit party, really the big winners here in Wales last night, gaining a third of the vote, getting two out of Wales's four MEPs and doing very well uh, in most parts of the country. They'll be celebrating tonight. But as you were saying, the Conservatives, a terrible night for them, uh, not only coming fifth, but in so many places, coming fifth and being close to coming sixth. Again, serious questions being asked there. What exactly went wrong? Arwen, thank you very much indeed. Arwen Jones there for us in Cardiff. Let's get the picture in Scotland now, uh, where the SNP have comfortably topped the poll in the European elections in Scotland, uh, taking nearly 38% of the vote and three seats altogether. Our Scotland correspondent Lorna Gordon is in Glasgow. So celebrations amongst uh, the SNP there. Yeah, it really is a different story here in Scotland compared to what we've heard about Wales in, uh, just before me then. Uh, the SNP are set to increase their number of MEPs to three out of the six seats available. Nicola Sturgeon has been uh, speaking in the last hour after those final results came in and she called it an historic and spectacular victory for the SNP and an overwhelming rejection of Brexit by the people of Scotland. She said that the UK political system has failed and it had failed Scotland utterly. She then went on to add that Scotland said no to Brexit in that referendum in 2016 and she said this result makes clear we meant it. A, a, a very strong showing for the SNP but it is important to remember that a million people here in Scotland voted for Brexit in the European referendum three years ago and the Brexit party will also be sending a Scottish MEP to Brussels as will the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives whose vote held up better here than it did in the rest of the UK. Other big story of the night here in Scotland, though, I think is the dismal showing for Labour. Uh, they lost both their Scottish seats in the European Parliament. They came fifth in the Scottish vote. They actually came sixth in the Scottish capital, Edinburgh. Uh, two of their MPs uh, released uh, uh, some comments earlier on, and they said the blame for this lies squarely at the fault or at the feet of the Labour leadership. So a bad showing for Labour here in Scotland, a very good night for the SNP. Laura, thank you very much indeed. That's the uh, picture from Glasgow there. We can go now to our Ireland correspondent, Emma Vardy, who's at a count, uh, well, the count for Northern Ireland in Macrofeld. Um, they've been counting for a few hours now, Emma. When might we get some results? Well, we're expected to actually to get a result perhaps a little earlier uh, than people had thought possible. Um, fairly a lower turnout here by about six percent than from the last European elections in 2014 that's probably speeded up the process a bit three seats up for grabs here we're expecting that two of those will go to the two largest parties a seat for the Democratic Unionist Party uh, and a seat for Sinn Féin that's what's very strongly predicted we may be finding out the results of those two seats um, rather shortly actually um, but really the big contest here and the really interesting one uh, that people are focusing on is that third seat because for the last 40 years or so, the three seats here in Northern Ireland have been taken by two unionist candidates and a nationalist candidate. But we're expecting this year it may buck the trend. And a big reason for that, of course, is Brexit. That's really redrawn the battle lines in some cases because Northern Ireland, the majority of people here voted to remain. The Democratic Unionist Party has been very much a party of Brexit. Sinn Féin, very strong for remain. Um, so this time around, we're seeing an increase in support for centre ground parties, parties who are no longer uh, defining themselves as unionist nor nationalist. Uh, the party which a lot of people have been expecting to possibly buck the trend and take that third seat, the Alliance Party, very much um, a party of Remain. So Brexit, very much like in the rest of the UK, uh, making a difference to the old style of politics um, here in Northern Ireland. But it's uh, certainly not a foregone conclusion. And because of the voting system here in Northern Ireland being rather different from that of the UK, people rank the candidates in order of preference here. There may need to be recounts to uh, count up people's second, third and fourth preferences, perhaps, to actually find out who will take that pivotal third seat. OK, Emma, thank you. We'll be back with you when we get those results. But uh, for the moment, Emma Vardy in Macrofelt, thank you very much indeed at the count there. Uh, let's head back to Westminster. Joanna Gosling is there. So um, very disappointing night, to say the least, for the Labour Party and the Conservatives. And we've been hearing actually from Theresa May saying exactly that and indeed mm. Jeremy Corbyn with his comments too. Yes, and uh, they're both pointing out when they acknowledge the disappointing results for their own party that they were 
very disappointing for the other party too. In terms of what shifts here, though, in Westminster, um, it's about positioning going forward because, of course, there is that Tory leadership contest already underway. But uh, tough questions also for Labour in terms of whether they can carry on with that uh, position that they have held of um, what has been uh, called constructive um, uh, lack of clarity, uh, which was basically to try to keep um, traditional party supporters on side, whichever side of the, the Brexit debate they were on. So let's talk more about how all of this plays out now here with uh, Stephen Bush, political editor at The New Statesman, and Professor Amelia Hadfield, head of the politics department at the University of Surrey. Welcome both. Um, Stephen, uh, looking to Labour then, do they have to now become the party of Remain because the the pressure is on the Tories now to become to, to almost out out Farage Farage? They will certainly have a lot of internal pressure. I think the really important thing here is the group that we haven't talked about very much, but is actually the largest individual tendency in the Parliamentary Labour Party, which is people who sit for seats where the Lib Dems came quite close in 2005 after the Iraq War, or quite close in 2010 after Clegmania. And they will have looked at those results and gone, history's repeating, we can't have too hard a Brexit policy. Equally though, of course, there will be MPs in places like Yorkshire and the Humber who will look at what's happened to the Brexit party and will go, oh, you can't possibly have a, a, a pro, an anti-Brexit policy. So the odd thing is that the Labour leadership is going to have a lot of pressure to be more clear. However, that pressure is not going to be able to unify on what this clarity they want looks like. Um, Amelia, the real politic in terms of what these results deliver is not happening here, of course. It's happening in Europe. In terms of how that then plays out and impacts potentially on what happens here. What are your thoughts? Absolutely. I mean, we've had two elections. It's a tale of two elections. Another British one is finished, and I think it's what the polls predicted, um, and it's it's shown a, you know a really terrible impasse. But that's really only one half of the story. Now we have to translate back not just to Brussels, but to the other 27 member states, each of whom, of course, have been returning their own MEPs. Um, and now the point is, of course, how are we going to populate the European Parliament? I think one of the big stories coming out at this point is that um, the European People's Party, which up until now had been the largest and still remains the largest, cannot now hold an absolute majority with the Socialists and Democrats, which are the second largest party. Um, you need 376 seats in the European Parliament to hold that absolute majority, and they're, they're missing it by roughly about 49 or 50. And it does suggest, if we've seen brokering and compromise here in, in Britain, those same dynamics are going to be playing out in Brussels, are going to be playing out in the European Parliament. Um, and whether they reach for Social Democrats, whether they reach for the, the Lib Dem equivalent in Europe, or even the Greens, of course, which we've seen you know, very strategically sort of morphing themselves up and down the spectrum, that certainly remains. The second big theme, I think, coming out is that despite genuine fears about a populist swing, either left or right, um, it hasn't necessarily materialised. We, we, we've seen evidence, bits and pieces of it, but it's uneven. In its, in its sort of sum total. And the question is where? Where are they going to sit in the European Parliament? At this point, it's a, it'll be a disparate series of groupings. Some will be not happy to be sort of affiliated. Others will be very happy to sort of join maybe Salvini's, you know, uh, league group. Um, so that's that's a really big question about the, the, the sort of location um, of populists and Eurosceptics. And Stephen, of course, the reason for the 31st of October deadline is in order for us to be out before those MEPs, our MEPs, take their seats and that new grouping comes to fruition. How hard a deadline do you think we're looking at here? Um, it's sort of up in the air. You speak to some European diplomats and they go, they talk about the next extension as a matter of when, not if. Uh, they you know, tend to be countries with quite a large diaspora population who have no intention of inflicting the calamity of no deal on people who can, after all, still vote by post in their own country. You then speak to other European diplomats and they go, we can't have you people messing up wanting your own European Commission with your own weird internal drama about whether or not you want to be in or out, you've been given another ex this extension, decide. I think in practice, although we think about it as something that any nation can veto, I think as long as there is one nation around the table saying, please don't do this to us, I think in practice there will always be an extension. But that is quite a big if, right? It could equally go the other way. And, and what do you think, Amelia? Do you think that we will... Where do you think we will be on the 31st of October? I know the question is very much, you know, how, how hard uh, towards a no deal are we going to see the Conservative Party leadership race and then ultimately the, the leader win. But um, I think 
between now and then, you've, you've basically got the, the remnants of the European Commission w winding down. Just They're kind of in legacy mode at this point. They are not going to be remotely interested in, in the, the sort of psychodrama that continues here in Westminster, still less try to afford a Brexit um, relationship with, with the UK. So I think the, the idea of a possible extension with the, with the new folks, if you like, with the new European Commission is on the table. The problem is, at, at this point, you've got quite a deep split between Macron, who's made it very clear, you know, that the, this is it, he's not for turning anymore, and Merkel, who of course I think is willing to tolerate the idea of a possible extension if, if a better solution can be found, but by then I think possibly something of a spent force. Thank you both very much. I think you've summed it up with that word psychodrama. It's, uh, I mean, it's all to play for here because it is uh, now going to be a question of exactly how these results are interpreted by Labour and the Tories in terms of their policy going forward. We'll have lots more reaction and analysis here from Westminster for now. We'll catch up with the weather with Darren Bett. Hello there. There's a bit of a chill in the air today. It's warm enough when the sun is out, but every now and again you may see clouds looking a little bit like this as the showers come rolling in. And it really is remaining mixed through the rest of the day. Some sunshine, some showers, which could be on the heavy side, and it will be feeling cooler as well. The most significant change in temperatures is going to be in the northeast of England, where with a northerly breeze today, temperatures are struggling to 11 or 12 degrees. Towards the southeast and east Anglia, it's 23 degrees yesterday, so a high here of 19 at best. Uh, not too many showers along the south coast, the southwest of England, but quite blustery winds around here. Northerly winds coming in across Scotland, dragging down that colder air, and there are a sprinkling of showers across many parts of the country through the afternoon into the evening and slowly easing down a bit across western areas overnight. Some clearer skies in Northern Ireland and in rural parts, it could be down to three or four degrees. Elsewhere, typically around about six to eight Celsius. Now, Tuesday could be the chilliest day of the next few. We've got the colder air coming down on that uh, north to northwesterly wind. By the time we get towards Wednesday, it's less cold air that's coming in from the Atlantic, but there'll be some cloud and some rain. For Northern Ireland, many western parts of Scotland, Wales, western areas of England, it may well be dry on Tuesday. There'll be more in the way of sunshine further east, particularly through the Midlands, eastern England. There'll be quite a few showers, and those could be heavy and thundery once again. And temperatures, as a result, will struggle to maybe 10 to 13 degrees further west and towards the southwest, 17 or 18. Gets chilly overnight, mind you, because this uh, brief ridge of high pressure will kill off a lot of those showers. And then we drag in this Atlantic air, that means more cloud, higher humidity, and some outbreaks of rain too. There may be some early sunshine down the eastern side of the UK, but we're watching the cloud thickening from the west, some outbreaks of rain pushing across too. Not much rain at all in the southeast of England. Temperatures here still 17, maybe 18 degrees. Northern Scotland, though, seeing a mixture of sunshine and showers, not really getting that warmer air just yet and not getting the rain, but it is going to be moving its way northwards. So through Thursday and Friday, we'll see the rain moving away from northern England, heading up into Scotland and Northern Ireland. Most places becoming dry over the weekend, really warm in the southeast of England. Highs are likely to be in the mid-20s.